call to order the uh, public comment, or sorry, to call to order the meeting of the monthly Roxbury uh, Board of School Directors. Um, hey Jim, yeah. I'd like to make a motion. I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna take care of that. Immediately. We have a few things to add to the agenda. Um, we're gonna add on a discussion of co-curricular and teacher contracts, and as part of the enrichment coordinator position discussion, we are going to add a discussion of uh, an update on where we are with the after school programming for next year. Generally, as probably most of you know, the committee appointed to that um, wrapped up its work and made a recommendation to Libby, so we've got a report there, and those two items are related. Um, so any other comments on the agenda? Libby, did you want to add? Yeah, the FT for the middle school conversation. Oh, okay. We talked about earlier. Sorry, thanks, Pam. Is that the one at 640 or am I wrong? The yes. MHS yes. and FT? Yes. Add MSMS MS to that as well. Okay, and we're going to switch it around a little too. We've got um, a discussion of the Roxbury kindergarten uh, age cutoff date. John is going to be about five minutes late, so we're going to try to start that at 645, and then we're going to give hope the first slot because she has a busy week and, and uh, wants to go and study and do busy, busy <laughs> things. Okay, um, so the first item is public comment. Any public comment? Um, no, great. Um, next, moving to the consent agenda. Uh, motion to approve the consent agenda. I move to approve the consent agenda. Um, second. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Consent agenda approved. Uh, oh, floor is yours. Okay. Um, so Emma can't make it and she wanted me to let you know that she wishes she could be here. It's Abenaki Recognition Day at the State House and she's Abenaki and so she wanted to you know, support her heritage and, uh, and I'm sorry that I do have to leave early tonight. I know that it's spring is a busy time for most juniors and with AP exams and standardized tests I just have a lot on my plate right now. So. Um, and Emma did work on the list that I have, so she does have some input and contribution in what I say tonight. Um, so we're just gonna follow the usual format with student celebrations at the top. And so today, a lot of Montpelier students were really instrumental in planning this, but we just had our Rally for the Planet, and it was the fourth annual one, and so students got permission slips and were able to leave for second and third block and it's an event organized by Youth Lobby which Emma and I are both part of and it's a youth advocacy group in terms of legislative activism as well as just organizing events and like the Rally for the Planet and so um, Emma and I did a lot of work lobbying and talking about policy and we both testified on legislation together a few weeks ago uh, and it's, it's usually climate change centric and so we were just able to go out today and enjoy some time outside and hear amazing speakers and listen to music and um, just have a good time in general. And um, next week, I'm going to be participating in the Allstate Parade, which is our first one in some odd decade that's happening through downtown Montpelier. And I play the violin, and so I'm also going to be participating in the Allstate Orchestra for that, first violin, but I'm playing the shaker in our marching band, in our, um, you know, so like, um, samba. yeah, our little um, <laughs> impromptu marching band that we've put together, even though we don't really have a marching band at MHS, so it'll, there'll be like hundreds of kids through downtown Montpelier, so it'll surely be a sight. Uh, and at six o'clock? Yes, it's at six on Wednesday. And then Thursday and Friday is the festival which is taking place at U32. And I know some people here are hosting, so with that. Um, <laughs> Did you say there's going to be a marching band parade in Montpelier on Wednesday? Yes. yes. And it's going to be in class. Yeah, we're, it starts at the middle school. I will be in it. Solon Samba. <laughs> 
Um, How many of you think they'll be? My daughter will be in it too. How many? Um, also, she's like playing with this huge drum that is like <laughs> okay, half the deal. size of her. It's just, it's, it'll be, it'll be interesting to see. Um, so six Wednesday. Do you have any baton twirlers or anything? What's that? Oh, really? Wow. Just from Montpelier. Just kidding. How many of ours? Yeah. <laughs> How many of ours? Yeah. You got them all? They're not all in? No. 20? You got 20 maybe? How many kids are in Solon and Samba? I'd say like 20, 25. Cool. Yeah. Very good. To add to that, there's going to be buses parking at, mul at multiple schools, so they'll be on at Main Street as mm. well. So just if you're trying to get through town, navigate your, if you're not coming to the parade, which hopefully you all are. But there will be some traffic congestion with all the buses coming in. Yeah, if you're trying to get through town, you won't. <laughs> uh, and this past week was prom, and I just wanted to give a huge like shout out to the prom committee because I know they worked really hard to plan this, and I had a great time. And and also when I know she had a great time. And Girls Ultimate played their first game a few days ago. And this week, um, this weekend, Ultimate is hosting the Capital City Classic, which is this huge MHS tournament. Um, and Club Action and Interact are Banding together to organize the Empower Vermont Festival. And it was something that Emma actually started last year, and it was the Livelihood Music Festival, and we renamed it Empower Vermont this year. Uh, and it's in the works, but a lot of different club members, underclassmen and upperclassmen, are working to plan essentially a music festival that will also serve as a fundraiser. and benefit a Washington County based organization to help survivors of sexual assault. And that's partially like why we decided to rename it, just because we really like the idea of empowering others and that being our new name. And yesterday Mike News came to the Montpelier High School campus and they're an inter they're like a they're online and so they're like a national news organization. And so they came for the second time, which is kind of phenomenal um, and last time they had come because we raised the Black Lives Matter flag and this time they were coming to interview youth lobby members and members of Montpelier High School Earth Group and um, I was one of the students interviewed and so was um, Mr. Sabo, Tom Sabo's son, Matt Sabo and he goes to 32 and it was great to talk about the sense of community that I feel at, in Montpelier and also how I've been able to I don't know, grow as an activist and advocate and find support for my school community in doing so and the work that we've done as students in the state house and um, it's also just hilarious like being on camera and having to like walk around the building with Max Sabo pretending that he goes here. <laughs> it's just like, uh, when it comes out it'll, it'll definitely be funny to the people who actually go here and um, work here. And AP exams, SBACs, and science assessments. I know that even though I'm, I technically have a late start. I'm taking since I'm taking AP courses. Um, all the freshmen are going to be doing their standardized tests, and some students have a late start. I know that AP students and AP Bio and A Push on Thursday and Friday will be coming in at regular time and doing some practice sessions. And I took science assessments last week and. I am taking some AP exams, and so I know that essentially, like all through the grades, we're kind of um, experiencing standardized tests, and so we can answer questions if you do have any about what that is like. Um, and as for student concerns and student needs, it's essentially just remain the same in terms of students' educational support systems and how best we can promote equity. And I know that you all were just meeting in regards to that, so I'd love to hear about any updates you might have and just how we can support diversity and inclusion in the MRPS education. Um, mm -hmm. And I think also in light of some recent events and just like a, a culture that I've noticed in um, some social groups at my school, just how we can go about changing that. And I think it ties into the work that we've 
done with restorative practices and how, what we're trying to implement in the MHS community. And it's a multi-year process because with restorative practices, you want to implement them right and make a good first impression so that students and community members don't really become resistant to it. And so we're really thinking this out well. And it's a student and faculty staff coalition that's working on restorative practices at MHS and I'm part of it and we met yesterday um, at, with Lou Ciceri and he works in the planning room and Lisa and Amanda Payne and guidance and talked a little bit about small changes we can make right now and how that'll fit into the bigger picture of uh, what we can do to foster community and and, and restorative practices is not just a restorative justice piece. It's not about what happens when something goes wrong. It's also just about how we can foster community and a sense of trust um, between teachers and students, even though teachers are authority figures, and how we can go about that. That's, that's it. So I can, I'd be happy to take some questions if you have any here about the meeting you guys just had. <laughs> Questions for? As always, thank you. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Especially on a busy week, I appreciate it. Good luck. Do you feel optimistic about the restorative justice process helping with the current situation? I think so. I think that it's kind of the only solution that'll, I think that the, I think that the problems that I and other students have noticed are a product of just a negative culture amongst peers. And I think that restorative practices and restorative justice is perhaps the only, or at least the most effective way to sufficiently solve the problem of that negative culture and change it so that it's less toxic, I guess. Um, and that's that is kind of the only solution I see fit right now for the best. What's the how is the overall culture in the high school changed during the standardized testing periods? Oh, um, does it get intense? Does it get grumpy? Does it mm -hmm. is it none of the above? Is it I not a big deal? I wouldn't say overall it's anything I you might hear some cynical comments about standardized tests from students, um, but I think that's essentially as bad as it gets. And overall, the school culture doesn't change in response to standardized tests. And I know that for juniors, perhaps, it's a little bit different just because we pay a lot of money to take AP exams, and then we have to deal with the stress of taking them. And they're like one each week, depending on how many AP exams you're taking. So, But we're all in this together kind of um, thing. So, so yeah. you have to pay Oh yeah. yeah. All four. It's like yeah. I guess it's ninety four. You pay yeah ninety four <coughs> per AP exam you take. Add it to this budget. We have to pay for it too, so it's like ninety four per exam you take. And you could take the AP AP course and not get the test. Not necessarily. Can you? So it depends. I know I, my daughter has one where she has to take the course as part of the. She has to take the test as part of the course. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like her grade is dependent on it kind of thing? Mm -hmm. On the test result? Yeah. The course should be incomplete, I guess. If she yeah. I wonder if the, the teacher decision. Is there a subsidy stream somehow if they if folks need it for the AP test? No. Any idea? Yeah, we, uh, am I talking next? <laughs> Maybe. You're talking yeah. right now. <laughs> yeah. Well, you're talking now. Um, yeah, 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 no, I, I, somebody said put it on the equity list. I put it on the equity list. I think we've, uh, when need has been expressed, we've problem solved it ad hoc. But I think we just were talking about this recently, the, the guidance counselors and myself, around you know, how can we uh, take this financial hurdle and burden out of the situation. There are, College Board provides uh, free testing uh, for students based on income levels for the SAT and the PSAT, mm -hmm. but they don't for AP. Mm -hmm. And so it, it's it's a problem. In so, my old district at MVU, which had a high, much higher 
uh, percentage of kids on free reduced lunch, we used Title IV dollars when that came out. We wrote an investment to cover AP exams and SAT, PSAT, um, and we made PSAT a whole school expectation that we did during school so that kids could see that there's a possibility, you know, just not, just not choose not to take it. So we made some very intentional moves in that manner that are possible to do here as well. So PSAT is not something that's done um, in our schools right now. Yeah. It's done, but it it's is. a student choice. It's a student yeah. choice. It's not, it's not. But it's not, but if the student elects to take the PSAT, does the student have to pay the fee for the PSAT? It, unless they qualify for a voucher based on income. If you're demanding income. what percentage of kids get the PSAT? I don't know the exact percentage off the top of my head, but it's high. What's their full, what's the fee? Um, they probably remember because I haven't been a guidance counselor in six years. <laughs> it used, it used to be like $30. I think it's 25 yeah. but um, I think you take you pay the fee when you're a. I don't I don't know if it, you pay it both sophomore and junior year. Maybe it's just when you take it as a sophomore. I'm not. I mean, if, if you take it as a tenth grader, mm -hmm. uh, you can't qualify for the college oh, board's okay. Okay. waiver. If you because that's early. Mm -hmm. If you take it as a junior, at the beginning of your junior year then you can qualify for the waiver and not pay for it. And this, I think for the last two years, we just paid for them all. Okay. Yeah. This is a Googleable answer? Yep. So the <laughs> PSAT registration free for 2018-19 is $16. And what's the AP fee? Is it similar? It's like 100 bucks. No, it's anymore. That's, 94 that's per high. AP. And that's, high. it's also unfortunate that that's the one that isn't. Like that most expensive ones aren't the ones that are covered. I think you can get a fee waiver for AP exams, but I think that it's definitely, there's like a stricter, I don't know, vetting process in determining that, and your income level has to be like substantially low, and they can't, yeah, it's it, it, there isn't really flexibility in, in the AP exam fee waiver. Yeah. I mean, there's all sorts of equity issues there yeah. in terms of people who access it. And also, you know, that's if, if, that's a, you know, if that's a money issue, it's kind of like money issues becoming money issues, but that's a money issue, you know, if it's mandatory, then I guess it's not being clear because they can't cover it. Mm -hmm. If it's not mandatory, I can see someone skipping the test because they don't have the $94, mm -hmm. which right. means that they don't get the AP credit. They which lose means the they, benefit. But they lose the benefit mm -hmm. of not having Something. to take that valid course, which can be expensive. Mm -hmm. So... That's exactly what I was thinking. Yeah. It's a good thing to put on the list to discuss. Yes. Okay. Thanks, Hope. Thanks. We appreciate it. We didn't really answer Hope's question. Hope wanted to, Hope asked about our discussion about right. equity. Do you want to sum we it up? Just sure. Sure. That question we just begun. We talked about really, like, we're, we're getting to true equity when we redistribute resources into groups that have um, historically been marginalized. And that can be very hard. And how do we uncover where we do that? I would say even beyond resources, I mean, also things like narratives and yep. power and perspective and decision making. And um, because I think in some ways you can perpetuate inequity by just distributing resources but keeping all the power structures in place that, that make it hard for people to really push the bit. Let's say we sprinkle some stuff over there. So it was it's a very good discussion. Yeah. And it's going to, we really want to continue it. And, and if one thing we came out of it is that we want to be more intentional about thinking about equity in everything we do rather than having it be like an occasional side of discussion. And AP courses do come. Yes. That's good. Mm -hmm. That is good. Okay, anything else for a hope? Thank you. Thank you. Go study. Thank you. Good, good luck on the test. Take it easy, folks.
Remember what I was telling you too, don't forget to have fun. Um, so a couple things, we have uh, one uh, project request from John Greenfrey, who's on the agenda. Um, Sarah came in after public comment. She did reach out to Libby and I earlier and say that she had something she wanted to say. So I'm going to make the rare move of opening up public comment again because Sarah did say that she had something she wanted to say. And, Thank um, you. Couldn't yeah. quite make it online, so. Sick from daycare, so. <laughs> Whole afternoon got changed. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. Awesome. Um, and you can sit or stand, whichever you want. Awesome. Yeah. Is it? I'm way too short. <laughs> um, so thank you again for letting me submit public comment and for listening to my emails. Um, I wanted to have a discussion or just kind of relay my thoughts around the facilities primarily at Main Street Middle School, um, the impact that that has on culture and learning, and um, at least express my hope and desire for the board to really think about that building and how that presents learning as a whole to our community, but also what service is providing for the middle school. So um, my son is in fifth grade. He is, um, he's moved from UES, which I think is a historic but beautiful school. Um, I've come now to Montclair High School several times to sit before you guys. Um, and I think this too is a beautiful school and that's not the feeling that I get when I walk into Main Street Middle School. Um, there's a lot of concrete, there's not a lot of light, um, there's a lot of disrepair. Um, if you go down into the cafeteria, it certainly isn't a place for mingling or socialization. It's very cramped and tight. Um, and I see that there's a lot of work that needs to be done to that building and I think um, that that work isn't being done. In, I understand that you guys have capital funds and you make repairs, but to me that's more of a repair and is in need of a complete overhaul. Um, in so much as you know, you're really going to have to start planning on how you want to either revitalize that building or are you going to relocate that school. Um, and I recognize that that is not something that will happen in my fifth grader's lifetime, but I also have a a nearly two-year-old and hope it's something that by the time he's transitioning to Main Street Middle School, it's something that is being talked about or hopefully has been achieved. Um, I would recognize that in addition to that environment as a parent walking in, the impact of that on the learning environment, I've read a lot of research around how the learning environment is affected in the sense of where kids behaviorally fall, the way that behavior is perceived, um, I don't know how many of you have been to Main Street Middle School, I'm assuming all of you. If you walk on that playground, there's like a basketball court where all the concrete is cracked, so the kids can't actually play basketball because they think everyone's cheating because the basketball <laughs> literally pops in the wrong direction. <laughs> there's, um, there's a couple four square uh, places. There's what Owen calls like uh, a tent-like structure in the middle where they there's a table but there's no the chairs. The gazebo. The gazebo, <laughs> thank you. Um, and then there's some swings, and that's it. And we have kids who move from Union in fifth grade who still very much need to run around. And I know for myself, my son has had some definite behavioral issues this year, and a lot of those have taken place in snack recess and lunch recess. And when I talk to him about it, I'm going, and then I went out to the playground to try and understand what he was talking about. And I'm like, well, no wonder this is going on. Like, what is there for you to do? What is there that's positive here? It's no wonder that there's so much social behavioral interaction going on where he's so consumed with what everyone else is doing because really what they do at lunch recess is talk. They're not interacting playing soccer. So he said, you know, at Union, his favorite thing to do is play soccer with the goals, and they don't have that um, opportunity there. He did mention that there's the field in the back that largely is covered in snow and these different type things. Um, so I think overall, I just wanted to say, I feel like this is something that the board really needs to address. Um, it's a long-term planning issue. Um, but it's something that I hadn't heard previously in my meetings that I'd been here and the engagement that I'd had with the school. Um, 
I also think there are things that we could do in the meantime to mitigate some of those issues. Even, I mean, you can add fresh coats of pastel paint and they show that that has a positive impact on behavior. Whether or not you choose to do that is up to you. But I think that there are things we can do to have that impact. And I know in my discussions with Pam and um, Matt around behavior in this culture at Union, um, there's definitely, my understanding is that I'm not alone as a parent in struggling with some of the behavioral aspects, but also just some of the frustrations at Union, and I don't speak for them. You mean Main Street, sir? Or, yeah, at Main Street. <laughs> so I think um, it's important to recognize that like that building has a huge effect on how we present ourselves, how the learning environment is perceived, and what kind of environment they're leaving coming from Union and then having that impact at Main Street. So I'm hoping it's something you're going to approach. My second topic would be um, the use of detention at Main Street Middle School and the national um, move towards restorative practice, um, the recognition of cognitive behavioral therapy, or like processing, so doing, uh, if you have a behavioral incident, going through that with a student and then going through like what could you have done differently, how can we repair the harm. Um, my son hasn't had a detention, but he comes home every day with a list of kids who have had detentions, even though I don't think that they're new kids every day. It seems to constantly be on his mind, and it's almost idolized in his mind of like, oh, this is something, you know, that's weird, and maybe I should try and get this, or oh, these are all the kids who did this today, and this is what they did to get detention, and it's like this rumor mill that goes on, and I'm constantly surprised, one, by the fact that this is what consumes his social interactions, but two, by the fact that we're still um, using this practice in such a progressive community. <laughs> I recognize that the board has very little say over that practice, but for whatever influence you do have, I would encourage you to look at the national standards and the policy movement towards that and move towards more restorative practices. And the last thing I want to address, which I've talked to Libby about, is um, my interaction in Main Street, where I feel like there's a lot of just culturally, um, there's been a ginormous shift between Union and Main Street. And I haven't been able to completely put my finger on it, but the kids are quite frankly just mean. And the things that my son comes home with, and he doesn't want to go to school, and he doesn't find school to be a positive environment. And we just spent um, nearly two weeks in England, and he was a different kid when we were gone. And I just checked in with his special educator today, and she's like, he's right back at it. He doesn't want to be here. He doesn't want to interact. And when I ask him about it, it's all about the social and behavioral interactions and the lack of um, support that he's feeling in this environment. And I, I've talked a lot with Matt about this, and I, I really am I really value all the things that he's doing and all the work that he's trying to achieve. Um, and I think that there are steps that are being made. But when I talk about it with Owen and I talk about it with other parents, I'm not looking at it as a singular, as a parent who's seeing a singular issue with my son, but I'm seeing it as a systemic issue. And there's a, there's just, you know, we're recognizing a society, we're moving on. and. Um, we're going through this great evolution of change, and there's a lot of meanness going on, and a lot of bullying, and a lot of kids are just not nice there. And I think that's something that really needs to be addressed. And um, and I think some of that could be addressed by things like changing detention to restorative practices, incorporating um, things like uh, you know circles of support and accountability. So. That's what I came to say. I really welcome all of the hopeful insight you might have in that issue, and um, I hope you guys take some of those things into consideration in your next policy moves and capital funding. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. no, thank you. And, and we do have um, facilities is a subject that we're planning to discuss as part of our retreat, and clearly MSMS is a huge need on that. Um, and I definitely want to echo your sentiments about restorative practice and detention. They're, they're at odds, and it's um, the most surprising that we still have that practice in the district. So, so thank you.
think you can do a lot with really small changes too. Thank you all. I think I'm going to sure. need you to go back to my <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, good luck. Sorry. Thanks, Sarah. Um, so, next on the agenda is uh, John Gufray, who has a request to the board. Um, do you want to come up and kind of speak for a couple minutes? We can do it any way you want to, but I'm happy to give you the report. We can do it the easy way or the hard way. Yeah. <laughs> um, and everyone did get your letter. Mm -hmm. so. Okay. I, I won't fault any of you if you didn't go through the exhaustive length of it. Um, <laughs> can't usually be faulted for not being thorough. It was um, thorough. <laughs> so uh, any of, I, I guess what I'd like to do is ask the board, and I appreciate you having me here, uh, to consider my request for you to reevaluate the policy uh, mentioned there. Um, I don't know. Uh, I did put some speculation as my guess was that that was one of the easy merger policies because they were the same date and it was probably just let's move on to more important things. Um, however, I think that it might have, uh, at least in our situation, it seems like it's raised a potential question, um, certainly a question in our mind about uh, is this policy good as it is or should uh, or is there a better way, perhaps, to do that? So uh, I don't want to go through all five pages of it. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions, but I guess um, I want to make sure that the board understands where I'm coming from in my request, and I certainly have thought through it and on a variety of different levels. Um, and would like to provide my feedback as well as some other uh, insight, I guess, into it. Uh, I did try to find out from uh, the Department of Education, if they track the how many school systems use September 1st. Uh, for those of you that don't know, the, this, the state mandates uh, that you be five by December, well, before January 1st, so December 31st, and that you're in between, basically the dates are September 1st to December 31st and then it's up to the districts to figure out what they want to do. So uh, I've got an answer from the Department of Ed. They do not track that information. So unfortunately, I don't have that. However, I've been searching for that. I was trying to find it online. I did come across an article. I think it was on Vermont Grow Kids, or I should have brought the website with you, but or with me. But um, there are several. It was. Back in 2015, so a few years ago, um, it was written and it mentions, basically it was an article about when to start kindergarten. Um, and talks about the goods, the bads, the research saying holding kids back is good, the research saying holding or advancing kids early is good. Um, there seem to be, at least in this article, three districts that were mentioned that have different ways of dealing with this, so what I'm asking for you guys to consider isn't abnormal, and it's not certainly an aberration. Uh, Burlington does have, particularly large district, has an appeal process. It appears that Richmond has one, because they're mentioned in here, um, with a parent who appealed to have their child uh, enter kindergarten early. And Winooski, apparently, at least at this time, was using the December 31st date, um, and mentions a kid that birthday was at that point and it worked out great and then it also mentioned lots of kids that whose parents held them back and entered kindergarten at age six and I guess what I gleaned from this is that there is no correct answer there's no definitive data on it um, and that it's really on a case-by-case -case basis now as I mentioned in my my letter to you I've been on in your seat denying one of these requests before um, when I was the board chair at Roxbury, we had to do this, and the general consensus at the time was we got a lot on our plate. Um, we don't want to open up this can of worms, and the answer is no. Uh, and I think on further reflection now on the other side of that equation, that probably wasn't the best way to handle that. Um, and yeah, and uh, not particularly proud of that moment uh, on the board. But it is what it is, and I think that's certainly a reasonable answer to my request, is that we just don't want to get down this road. Um, I guess I would encourage you to do that, and I think that um, 
you know, my mention about making good policy is, good policies, in my opinion, are based on objective data, but also have room to evaluate special circumstances, not on subjective means, but on by objective means. So while we have objective data, which the state says January 1, we're choosing September 1, we have that as uh, general guidelines amongst the education community, being able to evaluate on special circumstances and requests uh, using objective means, which would be employing testimony, say, from the parents, which is probably the least objective, um, but then employing the teacher, the current teacher, the future teacher, the principal, the superintendent, all the educational professionals who will do this screening anyways, um, but decide whether or not that that child uh, is ready or not ready. Um, that's something that certainly some districts have chosen to do, um, but it's different than what we've got now. It's pretty cut and dry to say it's September 1 and we don't have to have any of these discussions and I understand that and I understand the board and a supervisory uh, superintendent not wanting to go down that road. I don't think it will translate into a lot of um, a lot of requests. Uh, if we're I, I do mention the structural differences between Roxbury and Montpelier which I think is significant in this case um, not just from the size of the school, but the way the classes are structured there. It's a multi-grade classroom building. It's very different than what Montpelier has. We discussed some of these potential like growing pains as we merged and figuring out how to manage the bigger picture within different school buildings that operate differently. Um, and, you know, we've had three and four-year-old pre-K available five days a week for five years now at Roxbury, and that's not what Montpelier has or is used to. And I think that that's certainly worth considering um, and evaluating uh, simply because in the case of our son, um, he's missing the date of September 1st, but he has, in his case, been in structured daycare since he's been three months old and he's been in a pre-K program. I would like to see him evaluated by the educational professionals in his life to see if he is ready to move and I think that that would be an appropriate way to evaluate the request as opposed to just saying, well, uh, you know, John's making a good case, let's do it. That's not a good way to make policy. If I'm, if I'm persuasive, it shouldn't be about what I'm saying. It should be about the teachers who are saying, he's ready and, um, or he's not. Uh, so, yeah. Happy to, I'll keep dragging on so you guys just <laughs> chime in. Yeah, so I, I think Michelle had first. Go ahead. I just want to say that when I first started on the board, maybe, or early on, I thought that that was a very reasonable approach, John. Why don't we just have, we got a request, and I said, why don't we just have the kindergarten teachers do the evaluation? Because they do that. The preschool kids come in in the spring, and they do a little assessment of some sort. And I said, they can tell us whether this child is ready for kindergarten. And the teachers, the kindergarten teachers said, A, don't ever do that again. <laughs> and B, if you ever do that again, we're gonna do the same thing, which is say no, they're not ready. Because we think it should be September 1st. I guess I'd ask why. They're, it's not an they're, appropriate they're professional response judgment, by an educational professional saying I don't wanna do that. No, it wasn't that they don't want to do it. They didn't think that it was approach, that it was good practice. I, I, John, I read your letter. I wouldn't read it as deeply as a short letter, probably. So I kind of went, <laughs> I went quick. A little vertical. Yeah, I went fast. And uh, I understood most of it. There was the piece about the cohort thing, though where, you know, in the multi-age classroom and how, you know, the rest would move on without him. Can you rephrase that again for, can you go over that fact pattern for me? Because I have to say, I don't remember the details. So one of our concerns, and this just has to do with the nature of being in a small building with 10 kids in a two-age two classroom, uh, is your cohorts can be very small. And we've had grades where there have been one kid and zero kids in that school. Um, in the past, and in the case of his current pre-K class, all of his friends are 
a month or two or three or four older than him and are moving on to kindergarten. Oh, his friends or the entire? No, not the entire group, but right. the kids that he is interacting with on a daily, like linking up with socially and his peers. developmentally. Yeah. Um, and I've heard uh, that there are some fairly young three-year-olds coming into the, that class. And so I guess given my son's particular situation, uh, I'm advocating for the fact that you know my, his mother and I both feel that um, he'd just be kind of spinning his tires, hanging out with a bunch of young kids when his other, the kids that he's basically developmentally at that level at are moving on to kindergarten. So is it gonna hurt him one way or another? Probably not. We just feel that this is the best thing for him and within the context of not asking for a special exception, that's why I was approaching it from, can we look at this policy? Um, and does this policy suit our needs or could it be done a little bit better? Yeah. So my concern is that he's gonna be uh, emotionally and developmentally ahead of the rest of his pre-K class if he stays there because he's already done it and that class will have to really sort of retreat into picking up for these young three-year-olds. Um, and the other component of that is managing, and this is where Ben and the teachers at that school could chime in on this, is managing those classrooms can sometimes be difficult and we've had over the last few years there to have to really think about which age groups are going together based on the kids that are in the classroom, not necessarily just cut and dry on paper. We want a K-1, a 1-2, or whatever. Sometimes it just changes because, uh, and I think, in fact, they had some, you guys could correct me, Ryan and Lisa, on this. I think in the last year, while we were with WSSU, they had some of the kids out of like the kindergarten or the first grade doing part of the day with the class above because they were... Uh, they split the first grade class yeah. into 1, 2, or K-1. Yeah. And they did it based on situations they won't do again. It, w it wasn't based on best practice. Yeah. So, I, I, it's, not, it's not my specialty. I guess what I'm asking for is the evaluation of based on that we have this situation now with a small building with small classes and multi-grades and a situation where it might be appropriate um, to allow for this type of evaluation. And I, I mean, I get it, and I understand why they might not want to be put in that position, but, uh, you know, that might be best for them, but it might not be best for the kids. And ultimately, what we all do here is to create the best situation for the kids. And you guys may all disagree with me, and that's fine, I'm just making my case that I think that this is a reasonable thing and other districts are doing it. And allowing kids to join in who are born in the end of December um, at, that, at that age. And the state has said that that's okay, so um, I guess that I'm asking for you guys to consider that. Jim, what's our role in this? Uh, policy, right? So, so the superintendent doesn't have any authority under our policy to make Yes. That's where we are, right? So, and really, the board doesn't have authority to make board. an exception either. Yeah, we need to rewrite policy. We have, yeah. we have a policy. It's a trash for the policy. Yeah. So, thinking about our conversation about equity and how the policy that we currently have versus a policy with more flexibility, which would be more equitable to all students. At first, I was thinking a more flexible policy because that's what I was thinking at first, but then I was thinking that the access to the process itself of a flexible policy had has barriers for folks from marginalized groups. So I'm, I'm well, interested in exploring that more. Good and job applying our learning. Me, <laughs> <laughs> I'm a good teacher. So, <laughs> I, I actually like our policy, and I have to admit, I have a bias towards not pushing younger kids into older cohorts, especially at bigger age, because it's not just a question of 
of is this child ready right now at four to go to kindergarten? It's a question of, and we just heard about, you know, the tough social environment in middle school. Is it that a, you know, what would be a, a nine-year-old is ready to go to middle school? Is it a 17-year-old is ready to go to college? These kind of have like ripple effects through, you know, through the whole education. And there, there's a lot of research out there that, you know, people on the younger end and the more you push it towards the younger end of the social spectrum, they might be ready academically, you know, they might be precocious at four or five, um, but socially there's usually challenges and they usually catch up at some point. Um, and, and I also think there's, there's a fairness question. I mean, like, you know, my daughter, even though it wasn't through, through pre-K, the way that Children's House was grouped, at least at that time, my daughter, who's a September birthday, was grouped with kids who all went to kindergarten. For her. So she kind of had that year where, you know, her peer group had moved on. There was a younger group that came in. It was a slightly awkward year, but now that she's, you know, now that she's like in third grade, I'm definitely glad she's on the older side. I mean, there's, there's like, you know, I've seen the clear advantages of, of her being there. Um, and I think it would be, I think it would be hard to create a flexible policy without just pushing it back to January first because, uh, you know. Where does that flexibility come in? Play? I'm curious if maybe Olivia would be able to speak to what that objective guideline or test would look like. Um, you know, Michelle just shared her anecdotal story of the kindergarten teacher saying, no, we don't want to do anything. Because really, like any flexibility would have to come back, like John had outlined, with a subjective test that all four year olds will take this test. And if they pass it, they're granted. If they don't pass it, well, it's another year of preschool. We could do that easily for academics. We couldn't do it for social. Yeah. Social emotional, we, there's nothing out there for that that I know of. And plus, you can't predict the longer term, as Jim mentioned, mm -hmm. social repercussions. In either direction. Right. So, I want to be careful that the board doesn't act like uh, child development experts. I think we, we all have our biases, but we don't necessarily know what's in the best interest of children. Um, I know with my own child, I had the same issue where I wanted to advance her fast and I was persuaded by a teacher to stop doing that. But, and I think that teacher was right for my kid, but that doesn't make that child right for John's kid. And um, if our teachers are really good at the, being able to assess objectively the academic piece of it, that's great. But I think parents can assess the social emotional piece very well. They may not be experts on that, and they may need some guidance on it, but, are, but I don't know that we want to put ourselves in the position to replace that. And I don't, I don't I, obviously we should not be trying to make an exception to anything, um, and that this is a policy decision in terms of we would need to open up the policy, we would need to start the process of a rewrite based on research, we'd have to do all that stuff, right? And we need to be compelled, we'd have to have some evidence that that was something that we thought was worth doing. I think one thing I asked John was about the fact pattern around the cohorts. And what I was, I was trying to get at, and I don't know that I, I got there, John, is that if there is a, if there's something unique about the multi-age classroom that leaves the children coming out of that environment in a shock kind of a system or in, a, in an abandonment of their peer group somehow, you know, some unique situation. Um, then I think we might have a really compelling reason to open it up and say, you know what, the experience of, of Roxbury Elementary School kids is different than the experience of the Montpelier kids that we're used to. I'm not sure we got there. I don't know if we have that evidence. I think that there's kind of a circumstantial thing that occurred in your family situation that may not be universal or even close to universal um, there. There's, a, there's an adjustment that... And have the same sort of problem, have the same exact yeah. experience. Yeah, I get that. That makes sense. So, yeah, I think that, I guess I'm saying, John, I'm not hearing personally a reason to reopen the policy, and I think we're bound by the policy. And, yeah, I'm sorry to say that. I'm also, I also want to say, in deference to the policy committee, I don't think we rubber stamped any policy. I think we've discussed every single policy in our new... Uh, merged district 
for quite a long time. So I just wanted to state that up front. I thank the policy committee. Yeah. And, and I also think that if we open up the policy, there's going to be a temptation for certain families for financial and child care reasons to want to push their kids into <laughs> full day kindergarten because, you know, and I think there's better ways to address that problem that we need to address that problem, but I can see, you know, families that are struggling to afford to pay daycare, who, you know, you know pre-kids schools a half day, um, you know, with a kid with an October birthday saying, boy, if we could push them to kindergarten earlier, it would be a lot. Yeah, pre-K is a huge issue. Huh? <laughs> yeah, I mean, the pre-K situation is a huge issue. Yeah. Which, and it would, um, th these are two very different issues. Yeah, and if they, you know, if they, what they need to say is their kid is socially and emotionally ready, um, they'll convince themselves that that's the case. But thank you, John. No, it's, it's it's an important issue, and we haven't we haven't had that discussion. We've had the policy on the books for a while. So, and uh, Tina, I would never suggest that you abandon your duties. <laughs> thank you. I was just figuring that that was probably fairly low on the priority list in the uh, the policy yeah. review because it was going to be an easy one. So. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Thanks, John. So, um, Sam, are you ready to respond to the F1? Sure. And Matt. And Matt. And Matt can sure. come to the hot seat, too. Yeah. And um, before I start, can I ask her, Matt, would you be willing to sit for the after school discussion? It might be, um, you don't have to, but it might be helpful. run through this year we I went with a process that was already in place and it was a good process so I'm going to, I think we could do this, but one thing I'm learning as the school year goes on is we learn as the school year goes on <laughs> and, and, and it's particularly when you're new to a place right I'm learning needs um, and principals are seeing needs as they're getting to know new classes of kids more um, and better um, so so we want this for this fall so so I'll leave that. that's that to I was just trying to understand why we have a budget request to completely separate. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's why. Yeah, a few. And we, and we are going to address that a little yeah. bit soon. So could we have the people sitting at the table introduce themselves yes. for the yeah. people at home? Yes. Sure. So I'm Pam Arnold, and I'm the principal at the middle school. Um, my name is Matthew Roy. I'm the assistant principal at the main street middle school. So the first thing we wanted to do was apologize for not being on the agenda. Um, and thank you for letting us share our, our proposal with you. And as Libby said, we've had this conversation, we had this conversation around budget time. And you know, Matt and I will, will both acknowledge that this is something we feel is critical, but we also thought, well, maybe in a year, trying to be as fiscally responsible as we could at budget season, we really felt like, okay, so maybe in another year we'll put this, we'll put the proposal forward. Um, and, and I don't know if you've had it, chance to read it, if it would be helpful for you to take a couple of minutes to read it before we start talking. We got it right before the meeting I started. I think, it's, yeah, that's yeah, right. I think yeah. it might be helpful. Yeah, so it takes give a couple, you a couple minutes. minutes. Just, yeah. Maybe you can play music for the first <laughs>
thanks. So again, our apologies, but there was a reason why um, we asked Libby if it would be okay for us to come tonight. There were a couple in this in this item that you're on right now. There was some. Uh, there are some conversations you're going to have with Mike McRae, and it's it felt more appropriate for us to come and share our proposal in this same time rather than have another meeting where you're again getting a request for something potentially as an increase so it just seemed to align well so that's where our apology is is that you didn't get a chance to read this ahead of time um when sarah left i i said to her i said so sarah we did not know sarah was coming um and sarah did not know we were coming however a lot of what she shared with her concerns aligns directly with what our proposal is for you tonight um we are in our second year of restorative practices. And it's a, it's a multi-year process to implement those particular practices. You can't flip a light switch and have them all in place. And so we are doing a lot of work around that area. And a lot of the language that you see in this proposal, um, the fact that we are calling our support team a resiliency team, those are the kinds of skills we're trying to build with kids. And our, what we're hoping to, what we're recognizing is that there are a lot of kids, every kid, every child has unique needs and diverse learning styles. There are some students who need, some kiddos who need more support than others and they need different types of supports. And you saw in there a little bit how that looks right now. We, I would say, are more in um, reactive mode in dealing with student behavior rather than proactive, which fits with the mantra of restorative practices and the beliefs and the philosophy behind that. Um, we're limited right now in spaces. Not that we need any additions, although I, I didn't know what Sarah was gonna share about the facilities. Um, and she's identified some areas that we all know already and there are some plans with, with the facilities for that. Um, we have done a lot of, we've had a lot of conversations about shifting things around in our building and we are able to maximize space more efficiently than is currently happening right now. So we have identified a space where we would like to create a center for kids to be able to, any student who has a need, and Matt will talk a little more specifically about what some of those focus areas should be and that we want to be, but it's really a space for all kids. Um, and the other part that we're really focusing on is building the systems within our school at the different tiers, tier one is for all kids, tier two is for a, a smaller percentage, maybe 10% of our kids, and then tier three are those who have maybe more significant needs that, that we need to meet. We absolutely need to, be, to build more supports for kids. And we want them to be able to access what they need in the moments that they need it so they can then learn in the classroom. And right now, it's a little bit of shifting around. It's who's available to help in, a, in an immediate situation. And um, we're excited about being able to develop some core standards around social and emotional learning with the new coordinator of that particular position for the district. So there's a lot of systematic, and I think Sarah used the word systems, um, conversation happening at the middle school. Um, the teachers are asking for our help and we want to give them our help. However, we are being pulled um, to address the immediate needs for students and not having the time to get into the classroom to help teachers develop strategies to reach those kids in the learning environment. So there are a lot of pieces to this. We tried to condense it for you. Um, but overall, we will be creating the Resiliency Center regardless of what comes out of this conversation. Um, and then we'll, uh, we'll be proposing in a year from now. Um, we're hopeful that we'll be able to articulate that it is a big need at the middle school. Um, years past there was a planning room planning room is not the concept that we're looking for uh, we're looking for a place where kids can take the break that they may need to get the support that they may need in a sh for shorter periods of time so they can return to the classroom and also that teachers have been doing a great job at trying to monitor and uh, address the, some of the emotional regulation challenges that are happening in the classroom. And by the time that that has ex extended in the room, all students are impacted. And so we're, we're trying to support them all in different ways based on what their needs are. So uh, that's kind of the broad picture. Matt's gonna share a little bit about what some of the specifics are and then 
quite sure you'll have questions because I saw Tina already raising her hand over there. So <laughs> and didn't raise my hand and just made a face. <laughs> <laughs> no, it went like that. There was that finger went up. I saw it. Wow. Uh, so Matt's going to share some specific examples. So thank you for the opportunity to, to speak with you about this. You know, one of the things that's really impacted my uh, sort of my push and my desire to have this position added, as Pam mentioned, we've talked about, you know, uh, you know, fiscal year 21, so a school year in between where this would come up. Um, there's a few success stories that I'd like to share about things that have come up um, in situations with students that um, our ability is, is sort of maxed out right now, and I would say we're, we're probably overextending ourselves as a resiliency team and, uh, you know, with our administrative assistants included with what we're able to do for students. Um, and those have, those have resulted in some success stories. And I think that we have a number of students um, with the opportunity to take sensory breaks, uh, movement breaks, um, and sometimes behavior plans, incentive-based reward time or, or breaks that are earned. Um, those things have led to some success with students. I think we have a lot of students who would benefit from similar types of, of plans and opportunities. However, right now within our, within our systems, within our staffing level, within the, um, with what we have right now, it's not, it's not really possible to offer those opportunities to our kids. Um, as Pam mentioned, a lot of what happens right now is um, a reactive response to uh, misbehavior. Um, or, or in some cases, I, I think a lot of it's not misbehavior. It's um, kids are coming into the building with any number of needs. Um, some, some kids are entering the classroom with uh, needs that revolve around their attention and ability to focus. Um, some kids are coming in with you know, anxiety that impacts their ability to to, to remain calm or to, to sit quietly uh, you know, in a classroom. And we want those opportunities for students so that a teacher knows there's a place for a student to go proactively where if they start to see those signs of um, student behavior coming up, they can, they can say, hey, I think you know, this would be a great opportunity for a break, um, you know, a movement break, a sensory break. The student can, can access that space, kind of hit the reset button and be able to go back to class and, and really um, really access their learning without also disrupting other students. I think our teachers are doing a great job of trying, of understanding that there's not really a space for kids to go, um, really trying to, to keep kids in the classroom, which is obviously our number one goal as well. Is we, we want kids in the classroom, that's where the learning happens. Um, and so in some cases, you know, students are, are finding themselves sort of progressing through some, you know, a warning or a redirect and then move your seat and you know, a student may be spoken to several times before finally it's reached a level where the teacher's like, there's, there's no real other option right now besides sending you to the office. Um, at times, that student may end up waiting because myself or, or Pam might be in a meeting, we might be with other students already processing through some things, um, phone calls with parents and, and various types of things where a student could end up missing significant time. At times, that puts a real burden on, on the office staff. Um, it never feels good to have a student in the office um, having, having, you know, a, for lack of a better term, having some kind of breakdown where they're, they're emotional, they're upset, um, and they're kind of in a public setting. It, it disrupts, you know, I, I, it doesn't feel good on a confidential level for that student. Um, I think it kind of disrupts the business of the office and visitors coming in and, and seeing some of the, you know, students waiting to to get support or waiting to come in, in most cases, waiting to come into my office so that they can um, either process through behavior or in some cases they just need a place to be um, where they can kind of reset, they can talk through maybe things that are making them anxious, things that are stressing them out, some of the things that they're bringing with them from home, um, or just talking about what do we need to do when we go back to class so that we can be, um, we can be successful we can, and, and not disrupt other, other students' learning. Sure. And it, so I'm let, I ask them if I could chime in for a second. So when we're looking at the whole restorative practices philosophy, a lot of times these students who are being sent out because it's gotten to that level, they're, they're coming in with a feeling like they're in trouble, but they're really not in trouble. Restorative practices is about giving them that opportunity to have that conversation, to work through whatever it is that they need, and then return to their learning environment. So right now, that's it's a bit disruptive for for the students who are getting sent out, as well as the, the places they end up, which is the main office, and not, not the best location, which is why 
the separate space will make a difference with that as well. But I, I think it's, it's also that movement towards, this is, we want kids to recognize that they have a need. What's the best way for them to address it or to work through it and having that support, the support folks there to do that. Um, I lost my train of thought, but it'll come back to me. There's something about, it'll come back to me. So I, I, I brought something that I just want to show, and, and I, I brought it. We talked about this very strategically, and it's not I, for it. I brought this for the purpose of being able to have the opportunity to talk about what this pile represents. Yeah. Um, and so what you're looking at. Let's share what it doesn't represent. Yeah, so this, these, are, these are office referrals and detention slips. Um, and what? That's a big pile, Matt. Yes, it is. But let, yeah. us, let us talk through it, though. Over what time period? This is this, this is this entire school year, um, and so to me, what this what this represents is to not us. or to us. Um, this is not a of, of you know oh my gosh, there's an immense amount of inappropriate behavior or there's there's horrible behavior of bad kids. Um, if you were to read through a lot of these or, or most of them a large percentage would, would have the words distracting, disrupting. Um, a lot of these are connected with kids that are, are having a tough time in the class. Um, and, and it's not necessarily, these don't represent consequences. They represent, this is information for the office to have to, to talk with students about what's been going on. Um, to me, it represents an immense amount of time for students out of class. Um, where for some of these students may have had to wait a half hour to just talk about really what what are, I would say like some quick fixes, um, or, or where a student may have just, for whatever reason, been disruptive, needs to get something off their chest, needs to move around, needs to burn some energy, um, needs to kind of go through some grounding techniques, you know, some sensory techniques or anxiety reducing type of strategies. Um, and in a, in a large case, what I would say this pile represents is, is missed opportunities for students. I think that within and, and that a missing system to help support them. Yeah. That's the piece that we're really trying to articulate. That's that's the most important piece and kind of tying it in with restorative practices. You know, eighty percent of what we do within the restorative practices we want to be proactive. And so we want teachers to be able to identify students that you know, either they're looking antsy, they're struggling, they're starting to get a little disruptive and be able to take that, that break. Um, and, and access that sensory space at the resiliency center um, so that they can they can be more successful. It would also give us the ability to, to schedule breaks in. Um, sometimes students, particularly you know, fifth, sixth grade, have a difficult time identifying themselves. I need a break right now, some have that skill. Um, but it, it would, you know, having a space and a, and a person for that would allow us to schedule those in so a student wouldn't have to request those breaks or figure out on their own when they need them, but just have that ability to, when, when we know there's a student that needs them. Um, and a lot of what we see in that pile is developmentally appropriate and learning. Um, however, they need specific strategies and techniques that they can access themselves to help them grow through some of these challenges and situations that get them into a place where they're not in the classroom. Um, so it, it's not an atypical type of, um, it's not atypical behaviors, but for some kids, the length of time and their inability to um, find those strategies is, is a piece that we feel like we're not providing for them at the moment. And things like bullying or like physical violence, substance type stuff, though that would be presented to me on a different form. This is really classroom teachers communicating that a student's having a difficult time in class. Um, the, the last thing that I'll mention, that I'll talk about as far as what this, this pile represents is um, a lot of time that students could be in class that are, that are not a lot of time where students may be able to a quick break and, uh, or some scheduled breaks and, and time in a, a resiliency center would prevent a lot of these things from happening. And it's also, it's a ton of time spent um, by myself, Mrs. Arnold, and at times our school counselor, our social worker, um, where in particularly, I think that, that the time would be better spent with working with teachers on um, teaching practices that also help prevent some of these types of things from, from happening, where kids are more engaged, where um, the students are, where there's more access to, to learning that's built into the, to the teaching practice. Um, so those are the, 
Great. Um, That's our insight. Uh, Steve. Cornet, first, I, I, I really have a few really little questions for you, but I was hoping maybe, Libby, do you want to add any context to this before we jump into questions, just because? My only context that I would add is that um, I think it's an obvious need of more behavioral help at the middle school, there's a significant amount at the, well, I think there's a little need at the elementary school too, but there's a significant wraparound team at the elementary school, and there's even more of a wraparound team here at the high school, and there's a there's these two, and a social worker at the middle school. Um, and so I want Pam to be doing something else. I want Matt to be leading that process as terms of this is the system he's building, um, and not the main person <laughs> all the time. So yes, there's a, there, I see a definitive need. I, I wanted to kind of ask you some questions that are critical of all of us as we do this, but I wanted that pile, what else it might represent. Sure. We, we just finished a really great little training presentation on equity issues and you know, you guys have probably already gone through that as a team and really started, you guys are probably all on the same team as we're just getting onto the team. Um, we're getting in the arena. Yeah, we're going we're to get bloody too, right? So um, I'm wondering if that also represents our district's failure to really do this well in Tier 1 or really meet the needs of all of our kids in that classroom before this ever happens. I wonder if this pile represents the scale of our leaving kids on the margins when we don't want to be or, you know, I, and I, I see in your preamble here there's a piece about that these are for, uh, are scheduled into student plans. And I'm wondering how much of that, you know, I'm gonna ask you to, I'll ask you three in a row and then just let, I'll be quiet. How much of that represents kids who are on plans versus kids who are not on plans? That would be the first thing. The second thing is how much of that represents boys? And then I would, <laughs> and then um, I would ask you like, I, I really liked what you said at the end there, Matt, about um, that it gives you time to get in there and prevent this. But I guess my concern is like, is, I mean, that's really where it's all at, right? Is where we, we really wanna be doing is best first practice, best first instruction. Um, and to not have, to not structure our schools in a way that starts dividing kids into ones that can sit in that chair well for six hours and those who cannot sit in that chair. And, um, so I just want you to kind of like wrap all that up a little bit for me and I won't ask any more questions. I'm gonna to speak to the tier one question yeah. and then Matt can speak to the specifics. So that's exactly what we are trying to identify as well in our proposal is that tier one, our teachers, they've been working some with universal design for learning strategies and practices, which is providing information in different mediums and different ways to try and hit the diverse learning styles of all kids. They, they need a lot more practice and a lot more time with that. We need more time in helping to model that and to provide feedback to them in the classroom. So our focus right now has been tier one, which is all kids and all teachers. So what that pile represents, I don't know that Matt will be able to answer some of those specifically, but he can take a shot at yeah. it. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I'm hesitant to, to give a definitive answer about about the two questions. Um, I don't know that we've analyzed I, it that way. I'd be yeah, happy to, to, to get back to get back to the board. I'd be happy to, to get back to the board with those specifics. Um, I think that you know I I I would agree. I think that in, in large part, I think tier one practices can can go a long way to preventing you know a lot of kids from being sent out of the classroom and getting them more engaged. I also think that there are there are always going to be kids, whether they're on a, an EST 504 IEP, I think there's always going to be kids that on one day or another are, are just gonna need a space to go, whether that's somewhere, somewhere safe to go to work quietly, um, to, to get away from the classroom environment because for, for whatever reason that day they're really easily agitated, um, or if they're, they're coming in, it was a really awful night at home and they, they're anxious about things and, and unable to focus and that's presenting itself in disruptive or distracting behavior. I think those those situations are always going to exist, but I think what we'd love to do is have more time to work with teachers on on those those tier one practices that, that aren't just academic, but also what are we doing as a school in tier one for social emotional learning. Um, and there are different strategies for different genders that work. And 
I'm, I would by no means be suggesting that I'm not included. Like I, I, I really. Uh, we could wager uh, some agree. guesses, but we're we're That's not okay. going to do that. I agree with Libby. I mean, I'm not. This is by no means a proposal to be like I'm no longer, you know, working with kids on their behavior. I think that this is more. Um, there are there are large parts of my day at times spent with students talking about behaviors that I think could be prevented. Um, and and at times that that seems like an inefficient use of of my time and. I, Real quickly, I know that there's a couple questions. I know that we're, there's, there's a lot of time here too. With a few students that I've been able to, to provide some breaks for, um, it, it both scheduled as well as earned, um, it, it mainly taking place in the second half of the school year. Um, I think one that has probably recently had the, the best streak of, of school that, that students had for their entire time that they've been with us. Um, I think other students you know, are we're just we're seeing academic and behavioral success. Um, they're interacting, and they're just I think really in some cases for the first time experiencing success at school. Um, and I, and I, I, I wish we had that opportunity to offer to other kids. Yeah. I think. Oh, sorry. I have a question after that. Yeah, thank you. You can't see me down here. I saw you. <laughs> so I have a couple of questions um, that maybe just need a quick answer, but. First, what is, is this person going to be a social worker? Or is this person going to be a psychologist? Who are you looking for with this? So we've talked about it being under the umbrella of an instructional assistant position, but it definitely. So it is a true facilitator. You don't see this person doing counseling or anything? No, because by having this particular, where we would certainly be looking for some a person with those skills to be able to build the rapport with kids and to be able to have that consistency. But with this, it'll, it allows our social worker and our school counselor to be freed up to be able to be accessible to more kids because currently they, along with Matt, are doing these uh, the scheduled breaks for kids throughout the day every day. So they're, this person, we're a team, we would be a team, so mm -hmm. those kids who are in that space who need additional services, that's where we would wrap in our counselors and the other people with the expertise that that student might need. But we haven't, we did not talk about it as being a licensed individual. Well, then I'm <laughs> wondering at the urgency of it. And um, second, the, the, the data is incontrovertible that the exact same, exact same behavior um, of a white girl will throw a black boy into detention. And I'm worried about the subjectivity of what is identified as disruptive behavior and what is identified as behavior that needs to be removed from the classroom because as much as we couch it in terms of we're doing the student a big favor by doing this, by putting them aside and letting them get their hands out of their pants, it is still and will be recognized as this kid is disruptive. This kid no longer belongs in the classroom. We we're removing this kid because the rest of you need to pr be protected from a student who is, has had a bad night at home and maybe needs to be with his classmates. And so I would actually feel a lot better about this if you were bringing in a social worker, a licensed clinician of some kind, if you were bringing in someone that could actually move that child into a better place rather than babysit them. I don't think we need any, and I know you're dying to interrupt me, um, just dying to. But I don't, I think if we bring people into the school system to address the problems of students that are not otherwise fitting into the classroom by somebody's cloud-based definition of not fitting into the classroom, we need to demonstrate how it is we're turning that around in a professional manner. And um, I'm, I don't even know about that data in there. How many of those kids are on free lunch program? Um, that's, that's another issue that has to be addressed with behavioral issues and how it's perceived by the teacher. So I appreciate you pointing that out. And we're, So what we've shared mostly today is tier one. We do have tier two and tier three where we know those students who need that specialized, that therapeutic, those conversations, those, those um, scheduled opportunities with our school counselor and our social worker, we have those individuals. I think what we're also trying to articulate is that any student, and it's not a removal from the classroom 
like you're not welcome there. It's they, we're hoping that the kids are going to recognize, that's our goal, that I think I need a little space for a few minutes. This in our eye, in our vision is very short term, like it's three minutes, it's five minutes and they're back in the room. Kids are doing that now, all kids will ask, but for the kids who need that very intensive support, that is at a different level and they're identified. And that's built that. into their schedules. Yes, it's built it's, into it's their schedule. It's all part of the bigger plan, that yes. I realize that. And you can bring a kid out of the classroom that he knows he's being disruptive for three to five to, to ten minutes. The other students are going to perceive that as being disruptive and the other, their classmates are going to label them as the kid that needs to leave the room. And I'm just concerned, you know, there's another part of me that thinks, well, if kids have answered their pants, just throw them in a resist, recess. I mean, maybe we need more playtime in the school system, even at the middle school level. Maybe there's, there's a, I'm, I'm just, I don't feel like I have enough information to feel comfortable with this whole process. One of the other pieces that we didn't share tonight is, and I think this might address something that you're articulating, we have an SST block, which is an intervention block that's, depending on the grade, fifth and sixth grade, it's four days a week, and seventh and eighth grade, it's three days a week, and we've talked about in our conversations at the resiliency team level of, there are kids who might need intervention in a variety of areas, but their most critical one for this week or next week would be scheduling them into the, the gymnasium where they're actually down getting some physical activity. And kids, all kids could be grouped into that too. So that's a space that's already there. So if I'm someone who's struggling with reading and my extra reading intervention is SST, and so I'm always getting that intervention, I'm always feeling like here I'm spending all of my time working on the skill I need most, which is critically important, but there is a time where I need that physical break. So that's another system piece we're looking at. Um, we can I, share that in our proposal. I, I appreciate it, and I, and I understand some of the concerns that you mm -hmm. brought up. Um, I, would, I would offer a, a, as a thought and something to consider that a lot of the students, or some of the students I should say, perhaps a lot of the students that I'm thinking about as students that would really benefit from um, accessing you know, this type of, of space and, and what we're going to do is the resiliency center. Um, I, I would wager that a lot of those students really feel uncomfortable in the classroom because they know their behavior is disruptive to others. They know they're impacting the people around them. Um, I think that I, I think that giving students the ability to, to taste some academic success um, is really powerful. And I think that we have students that, um, as opposed to to I think no matter how hard I try, you know it's. You know, at this point, I need you to go talk to, to Mr. Roy down in the office. Is always going to have a negative connotation for for students. I think, you know, a teacher letting a student know, like, hey, I think this is a really good time for a break, um, really presents itself differently to the class and and to those students. And, and right now, we have students that, that ask for breaks, and we're not allowed to provide. We're not able to provide them. Um, so there's also students that, that want breaks and know that they need to get some energy out and are self-aware, particularly some of the eighth grade students, um, there's nowhere for them to go. I'm just going to have to go on the record that I am opposed to this. I don't have enough information in it. I don't know how the current system is being administered. I would like to know how many of those children on, are on the free lunch program. I'd like to know how many were African American. I think having had this personal experience in my family, I do not have confidence in how it will be administered. And I'll just say that. So it's my two cents worth. Uh, I, I think Michelle, Tina, yeah. and Bridget, and Michelle, I think it's Michelle, Tina, Andrew, and Bridget. And just a quick reminder, at 8 o'clock, we've got Mike, we've got after school. So um, thank you very much. Okay. Yeah, much in addition to what Becky has said, um, the pile of paper is like an interesting visual, but it just doesn't mean as much to us as would data. Um, I don't know if that's the same 10 kids getting in trouble every week, or if that's 120 kids each getting in trouble once, and how, and we if that could be turned into data, and then we could see, you know, if we hire this person, does it get better, or what does it look like? That would really help. I hate to even say that because I understand that that pile also represents that you guys are 
having to do too many jobs at one time, and now I'm asking you to do data entry too. But I think that would be really a lot more useful to us. And I share Becky's concern about the quality of the hire. We're mm -hmm. proposing potentially paying somebody $13 an hour. I think we did that a lot at Union in the past, just through IAs at whatever problem. Right. We had. And That's right. Mm -hmm. And then we changed. Then we reversed all that. Changed it to a teacher. Right. So. You mentioned we used to have a planning room. Mm -hmm. So uh, tell me that sequence. What happened to that person? I, I understand it's a different uh, theory of how we're proceeding, but do we Sure. Have? So enrollment dropped dramatically. Mm -hmm. I think that that okay. position, uh, there were two people in the planning room at one time. Yeah. Um, and then enrollment dropped. And then I think we were at like 176 units or something like that and then when Steve Mears retired we changed that position the, the room disappeared so the rooms have disappeared for increasing enrollment right um, and then we went to the assistant principal model instead of a beha uh, someone overseeing the planning room but we have in the past had an assistant to the principal but not at the same time as we also had a planning room so those those are two different type those are two different positions and it there was never two there was only one person so there was the overseer of the planning room and four of the yes um, so my second question has to do with the implication of this and it was a fast read I admit was um, they're on a plan so is this a reimbursable is this a special ed issue no this is it's really about all students. And not all students who have breaks or um, uh, breaks is the pretty much the big one. Or sensory needs mm -hmm. or yeah. movement needs are on IEPs. No, that is not that. That's not that the first paragraph. So we put all kinds of there's all kinds of plans, and so we put there's there could be a child on an EST, a 504, IEP, or it's just a behavior need. But they don't. It's not something that's attached to IEPs. Okay. Before I go away, for various reasons, I'd say we don't have enough, I don't have enough information to make this decision. So I think what's really helpful for us is we heard the data analysis of the referrals, because we can tell you what the referrals are about. So we can do that analysis, um, which is fine. We wanted to come at least get your thoughts about before we can, because we see it as a significant need. We do feel like we are not able to meet the needs of all of the kids in the middle school. Can you, can you tell me why this is May 1st? And I've not heard about this in the meeting before. So, as we shared a little earlier, we had these conversations at budget season. And, of course, budget season is in October, right? Before we get too far into the year, we've been doing, I think, an amazing job of trying to find strategies and supports that work for kids, but they're not all working. And um, I honestly feel like, we tried to articulate this, there's not enough people power to work with the number of needs that we have when those needs are happening. Uh, I, I mean, what I was gonna say is very similar to what everybody else has said. It's just, I, I think from a process perspective, us receiving this with little information ahead of time, without the types of substantive metric that, that folks are asking for. Um, I think it's problematic. Uh, I, I mean, the, the general question that came to my mind is the same one that Michelle first said, and it's the one that, um, that Tina just brought up, which is why haven't we been hearing about this? Why are we just hearing about this now? Why are we just getting all of this information five minutes before you request? pitch this request for this position. And maybe you're thinking, okay, this is heading into next year, and that's, that's fine. But um, in terms of the quality of information and in terms of the process used, to, used here, uh, it, it makes me want to definitely pause. So I think in the future, when you're coming to the board with needs, because I think everybody wants our kids to succeed, um, and we all want to support you in the, job that, in the jobs that you're doing, and we certainly want to support all the students and families. Um, it's just uh, how you approach this, I think, in the future, 
um, giving a little more lead up time would be really beneficial to the board and for you and your cause. Just we had talked about that because because we had FTE on the agenda mm -hmm. tonight. That's why I didn't look up. That yeah. was, that was so I, I don't want to like berate yeah. you guys because I know you guys are working your butts off. Wow. So. All right. <laughs> but I, I do I do just want to make sure that when we leave that we understand specifically aside from subgroup data, I'm not sure what other data you you are looking for from us. That that's just the one thing, and I think subgroup data can also be. Um, you can look at it a variety of ways. So that's the one piece I've heard, but I'm not sure what else. When you say data, it's helpful for us to hear specifically what it is you're looking for. Um, so first I want to say that I'm really glad that you came to talk to us, and you know, I, I think it made sense to be here tonight. We're talking about other issues that may be coming up in the budget, and, um, and I just want to thank you both for your very hard work on behalf of the kids at Main Street. Um, I know um, how difficult the challenges are that, that you're dealing with. Um, in terms of what I don't quite understand, I think would like to understand more, is the written proposal seems to be talking about someone who's covering scheduled breaks, which I understood to mean kids who had that built into their schedule or their plan, not not a kid who in the moment and after interventions is, um, is being um, directed out of the classroom, which is what I think the referrals are. But maybe, so I, I'm getting a little bit confused between point of the position and the schedule breaks and how that connects to, to um, referrals down to Mr. Noy or to our parents or to detention. Yeah, I, I, heard I think that, that the, you know, an added, an added person um, gives us the ability to schedule, just to, for more kids to have schedule breaks that are, that are proactive and we know is a, a need that they have um, that doesn't then prevent uh, myself, you know, school counselor, social worker, and at times even our administrative assistants from like adding something else to their job, which we all have full-time responsibilities right now. Um, and so that's one piece. I think the other piece is the ability for students to, to I, I would say kind of a way to look at it is to, to try to access this space before they are disrupting a classroom significantly or before they get themselves in trouble. Um, in, in a lot of cases, you know, the, it's the ability to 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 go somewhere, um, and, and sometimes they need to they need to talk. Sometimes they need to move around a little bit. Sometimes there's there's different strategies that, that you know you can do with students. That sometimes it's just the ability to, to get away from the space and just kind of regroup. Um, I think we can all kind of relate to that at different points. And so it's not just scheduled breaks. Okay. It's it's, it's a lot of those needs, yeah. and it's also. Um, to have someone that can help process with a student some, some really low level behaviors that might not be acceptable in a class but aren't necessarily ones that need to rise to the office level. Um, and, and that, and, and part of it is certainly providing more time to, for, for instructional leaders to be in classes, um, to be working with teachers, to be working on those strategies that would also help um, engage all students in really meaningful learning. Um, it, you know, at, at at times I think there are students that, that, that just need somewhere to go with someone and, and they just need some time away. And I, I don't look at this as a place that would be, um, that's punitive, that it's, um, you know, something along those lines. I think it's actually fairly common in schools to have spaces like this um, and, and it's going really well. And so. And we also feel like that pile is a systemic concern, not a kid concern. Yeah. And so that's where, you know, that data piece is, uh, I, we understand that that's important, but for us, we see that as that's something that we're not doing right, right for kids. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and that's the part that concerns us more than, than anything else. Of course, I feel like there was a part of your question that I didn't really didn't get to. Um, I think you answered, which is, so the person staffing the center yes. would also be Interact would be inter would be supervising scheduled breaks, but also interacting with kids yes. who have chosen to come there or whose teacher have to ask have asked has sent given them, them a choice yes. or sent them there. Mm -hmm. Do you have any? I mean, do you have any concerns that having a space like that will make teachers more likely to rely on it? I do. Yeah, yeah, I do. Yeah. Well, that's <laughs> why that's where we're not <laughs> interested in. Come, right? Yeah. <laughs> we're not interested in it being a planning room, which I think does have that sense. 
in that context. But yes, we are also worried about that. And we're worried in that we know it needs to be structured very carefully. And so, so, sorry. That's so okay. what happens if, if this doesn't happen? Because I, uh, I'm hearing a lot of concerns from the board. I think a lot of valid concerns. I think Becky raises a lot of good questions just in generally about you know, how, how we choose these practices and if, you know, how much they're influenced by you know, preconceptions we have about kids and about you know, certain uh, you know, kids who fit to, to certain um, you know, profiles, et cetera. Uh, but I'm also uh, wondering what's concerned about what's happening now. Um, and uh, not acting based, not acting because we have gotten information at the last minute and it's not perfect and you don't have everything we have. And as a result of that, leaving something in place that is keeping all these concerns that we've just expressed in the present and perhaps some additional concerns as well. So that's that's my biggest, that's my biggest take. I mean, I, you know, and, and I, I think this is a discussion we need to keep having, but I think as a board we have to think about, you know, if we push this off, what are, what's, what does it look like between now and the time we get back to it? Can we get a point of clarity, though? Because my understanding is Mike's coming to us about an enrichment coordinator. No, that's it, Mina. Oh, that's you. Mike's coming to us to increase FTE because of enrollment. Oh, okay. In class size policy. Yeah. Okay. Never mind that. Maybe let me the question I had whenever Pam had asked for what the board needs to see. Mm -hmm. You know, really since before our last budget cycle, you know, we get requests, we want to see more of this, we want to see more of that, people here, people there, let's fix all these things. But we've been saying, no, 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 we want to slow down, look at the systems, figure out what's in place. It feels like right now, all of a sudden, we're hiring, we're hiring, hiring. But I haven't heard how it's all fitting together or what's happening. Like, I want to appease Matt and Pam, and you know it sounds good, and let's help, and let's do what we can. But are we just putting the bandaid on, like we said we don't want to do, or are we actually starting to implement the systems change that we've been talking about the last year? Mm. We're kind starting. Like, we're starting to implement the systems change because so we know kind of more. We know that. more, and we've talked as leadership team. As Pam's nodding her head more about exactly having the same mentality as to what these things mean. Um, I think, you know, we're thinking systems, you know, the during public comment, Sarah, uh, you know, mentioned restorative practices, moving that direction, moving away from detention. Um, I think this is really critical for some of that work. Um, I see this person, if you look at some of the responsibilities, some of them would be trained in restorative practices that would be probably expected or, or hopefully uh, a member of our restorative practices committee at the school. Um, we, our restorative practices committee is, is working really hard. To, to really be able to do away with detentions, um, not next school year, but the, the, the following school year. Um, some of that work is the professional development and building our capacity and building our systems um, and not abandoning a current system without wanting to replace it. Um, I think that a big part of this role could, could also be um, facilitating restorative conferences um, and working with students to create plans to repair harm that's been done. Um, and so I think that that is a critical piece of this work as well that um, that, that, that they would create a, a person in space and time for, for those types of things to happen so that it's not, right now our system is detention because this behavior really, you know, people are hurt and, and people are affected. Um, but right now there's not the time, uh, the space, or the ability to, to really go through that process the way it's meant to be um, within a restorative philosophy so that students, so that we're really focused on repairing harm and building that plan to make things better um, rather than the opposite, which is more of a, I would say, a little bit of an old school type of system. Uh, Steve, and let's try to give us another five minutes. I can only speak for myself. I, I think what I'm feeling, and I, I, I'm, it's radiating from other board members, but I haven't checked in with them, is you, you have a labor shortage, <laughs> and we need to solve that labor shortage. I think what our, and I think we all support this, a solution to that labor shortage. That's an immediate need, but it isn't the, 
it isn't the big picture that we all are starting to really discipline ourselves as a board on trying to insist on before we move forward. I think that's something Libby has kind of introduced to us is this idea of, whoa, 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 slow down. Don't do anything without a big picture, right? Number one. Number two is we just had a presentation and we have all, for years we've been committed to um, equity in our district and now we're starting to put some real meat on the bones on what that means and I think we are now running everything through that filter of um, how is this going to work? How, how does this advance equity? How does that advance equity? If we're going to spend a dollar, how's it going to advance equity? And I think that what we want to, what we need is that bigger picture context for if we're going to say solve the labor problem, is, how do we solve that labor problem? And are we really, maybe we're willing to spend a lot more than this. Maybe we're willing to buy, you know, a different type of position that would be more robust than this. I don't know, but I feel like we're missing that that backstory, and I think that this green paper didn't get us there. And I think that what we need is I, I want to know what the philosophy is. I'm not I'm not comfortable with um, that we actually have a a, a, a uh, robust and comprehensive philosophy on how we're going to change the system around around discipline and support of students who are having these. You know, we're still using a lot of language that's been around for a very long time on these, and and I don't know whether that's really the most progressive way to think about these things. And I feel like we need to be convinced, maybe, and that might be Libby's job to kind of like lead us into a, a one or two sessions of here's why we're doing it this way. Here's why we're spending the money here. Do, so if we have three proposals for um, additions to uh, <laughs> staffing right. um, tonight, we and we do have a quarterly report, but we don't have a corresponding proposal to take these from the fund balance. Usually when we, I assume that this would come out of the fund balance, and normally we have to approve a section. In this position, uh, because Grant has been in trains, this position hasn't been talked about like that. The other the other positions have other funding sources that are not fund that balance are not related. Fund balance. Okay. Yeah. Um, but we don't know about this because Grant's Grant hasn't been, I haven't seen Grant in literally two weeks. <laughs> um, so, I mean, I fully support having enough people in the building to look out for the kids, but I do want to know what is in that stack of paper. I want to know, is it the same 30 kids over and over? Is it the same three teachers over and over sending their kids mm -hmm. out? You know, what are we... <laughs> so do you want to write down the list because you asked what data inputs? Yeah, we have that. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Just... Yeah, I, Okay. I just because I feel like she's Michelle's about to start rattling some no, off. That's all. I just I just want to better understand the problem that we're solving, and then I want to see whether we actually solve it. Right. And yeah. I think the other piece that I yeah. I hoped to had hoped to articulate is that there is a need for teachers to have more skills around working with all mm -hmm. students, and right now part of that missing piece of the puzzle is is my ability to do that. Absolutely. Yeah. And so that's another piece of it. Yeah. So, and then I agree with you. I don't want to kick the can down the street right. and leave you, but I think it came to us too quick. So I think we could right now say we'll put it back on the agenda at X amount yeah, of time with more data and with Assurances, it's part of the plan that this and really you know is where the money's coming from. Yes, well, that that's too. pretty yeah. critical. <laughs> but the, the issue of um, is this an all over plan that has to do with how you manage kids in the building? Am I assured it's not an instruction problem, or if it's an instruction problem, you have a plan for how to solve that instruction mm -hmm. problem? I mean, that bigger picture was what Steve and I think Jim was saying. So I'm, I'm not saying let's forget it, let's just. Yeah. And I think in general, though, I really, do, I know, I, I really do think in general, though, to get back, to just add to what Michelle said, though, in general, dropping new positions after the budget in this like urgent fashion when we haven't heard anything about it, that process sucks. It really does. That's well, my feeling. And, and I just, we want you to know that's that was not our intent. Yes. Yeah. But yeah. it, it's, it's but not. It's, it's I, I not ideal. At the same time. I think this was a tremendously important opportunity for yeah, us I to agree. share with you, regardless that you know maybe we didn't present it in the way that you would have liked. However, we could have tried to interpret and take a guess yes. at what you no, would I have liked I think you guys for us to great. share. No, I, I, and so I perhaps we bring back more detail. Um, but we do appreciate you hearing us 
um, and I just want to make one, one yeah, comment. That I, we're not looking to do management. We're looking to support yeah, kids. Can I add, put one more thing on your list when you come back? Could you explain why we have detention and why we can't get rid of it? And what purpose oh, no, is? we're fairly certain it doesn't fit in restorative practices. So We know that. So regardless of that, why can't we just get rid of it tomorrow well, we, if it's we, not? probably can. We okay. have still have to have a system for being able to process with kids. Okay. And that's missing. Okay. So. Right. Thank you for your time. Great. Thank, thank, you. Thank, you. Thank, thank you both. Thank you. We look forward to seeing you again soon. Yeah. Well, that, would you, you like us to come back or is yeah, yeah. going to tell us? Libby's like, going to tell you what she yeah, wants. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it could be more. So, Mike, Mike, thank you for your patience. Uh, and Matt, since that took longer, if you want to go, I think. Is it coming up after Mike? Yeah. It is coming up after Mike. Yeah. Yeah. Up after Mike. Um, it's totally your choice, but it's I'd it's say getting late. I'd say this one committed, so uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll, might as well stick around. His stomach's been growling for a while. <laughs> okay. Do we have Do we have Where's pizza? Pizza should be pizza. I think it's been a little over. Yeah, I'm taking a break now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> for that, for that. So McCreeth is here because, sorry, Mike yeah. is here. <laughs> I got it. Um, because he, we have a significant enrollment increase at the high school in the ninth grade. So you saw me some numbers earlier that are, it's a pretty significant increase and our core subjects are busting out of our class size policy. So it's the only time this has been said in the state of Vermont in this decade. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And this is not directly coming from eighth grade? We didn't know this was coming? Hi. <laughs> um, yeah, so it's it's pretty it's pretty small. So let me just tell you, um, I have talked to Grant. I had the chance to do that. Not that um, you aren't high on my list and close to my heart, you are. Um, but I did Get on with I, I did I did go to see Grant first, um, just to see what was possible. And I talked to him about this in November. And I said, I, I think we're going to be really close in English and social studies. I was nervous about English more than social studies. I said, I, I might need like a 0.2 FDE in English for somebody that's already part time and expand their job a little bit. And maybe like 0.2 when I'm actually asking for 0.1 in social studies. Um, do you want me to put that up on the screen in the budget? Uh, or would it? Would you just wait to see what the numbers are, and come in the spring? And he recommended. I'm not, I'm not trying to throw him under the bus or anything. <laughs> he's not here. He did. But, but you just uh, did. But not here. Probably not watching. Yeah, yeah. How was that conversation? He, he, he just said, let everybody else get in trouble. Uh, he yeah. said yeah. that. Well, he would be able to blame me for stuff like for years. <laughs> um, the, he suggested that's going to be so small. Just come in the spring and. Uh, so here I am. Is this for the rising eighth graders yeah, or the rising, ninth? rising eighth. So there, we knew they were a big group. We knew that we were going to be full, and we knew it was going to be really close. And basically, we just need to add a, a section, one section of English for our ninth graders. We have a, a, a part-time English teacher who has tentatively agreed, and in your approval, to to add a section to her uh, job. And that will do it. And then uh, social studies is also will be out of class size policy if we run it the way it is, unless we cut economics. Um, and I don't want to do that. It has 15 students in it. Uh, and I'd rather uh, push them into one semester. Um, we can just you know have them take economics first semester and have the teacher run a third section of social studies. Uh, Global um, perspectives, uh, global and international perspectives, and then the second semester she can just run those same three sections in the second semester. So that's why it's only point one. So it's not even point two. It's just point one. That's just do what, That's just what we need to make it work. You're like it's just point one. It's just. Point it's, seven. I mean, it's very. <laughs> tough. So that's what I'm looking for. So what about the MHS data manager? Yeah. That piece, um, we put that on the agenda. Mike, Mike, and I put that on the agenda when we um, 
got some information from a staff member that has not come true as of yet. So we're going to cross that out for right now um, and wait on that piece. And, but, so you <laughs> mentioned the eighth graders coming up. Mm -hmm. And it's that was an unpredictable number? No. What's unpredictable is the number of students that are going to come from Orchard Valley. Uh huh. Okay. And given so the, the transfer is right in. Now. So we, it's 116 students that are signed up for the social studies in ninth grade. Some of those are tough mm -hmm. periods because we do uh, we do have uh, global issues and perspectives is available to some to all tenth graders. Some tenth graders take it. So there's a little bit of a higher number there, and the ninth grader is at 102, which is again we. It could be very tight, um, and we could do that. Or what is likely to happen is happen the last couple of years. We get another five, six, mm -hmm. seven, eight, nine, ten students coming in, and we'll be way out of class size policy. So I think that uh, this will do it, and then you know you'll see what your numbers look like again next year. But right now, this this is what we need to make it. Because these children have registered to be here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. And how will this advance equity? <laughs> well, um, uh, I'm not sure. I, did, I almost just said the super honest thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, the teachers that are uh, going to have more FTE do some of the, our best work with writing, and they'll be making themselves more available to those students. There's just be more of them here. And so the class size will be a little bit smaller. They'll be within policy. And so students will have more access to those teachers, particularly around literacy. Did you just say that smaller class sizes improve equity? <laughs> I was trying not to. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. <laughs> um, you didn't set any problems I, up for maybe for the future at all there. And staying within our policy. And, yes. But, I mean, seriously, don't we have an opportunity when we add people to look at equity issues? I mean, isn't this a chance where we could say, you know what, while we're at it, let's, let's offer some different classes. Or we've got these great, we've got a whole bunch of new students come in. Oh, my goodness. The scale is better than it's ever been. This is our chance to also look at, at what we're offering or how we're offering it. I think that is coming. But this year, this is what we need to stay within class size policy. And then I think in the fall, and I've left a few notes for folks. <laughs> that, Note in the drawer. Yeah, um, that there will be more opportunities to think about programming with an increased number of students. And this place is just going to be fuller than it has been in a long time. So there's going to be um, opportunities to rethink space as well. Hmm. And you don't want point two on social. What ifs, so this comes mm -hmm. to the bottom line. So if I say no, can't happen. I'm going to close with economics. Oh. Okay, so. What about creative writing? Yeah. Yeah, we, maybe we'd have to close creative writing. There's 24 kids in it. So it's back to the meeting the policy. That mm -hmm. if, if we didn't do this, the class would be too big of a class. Yeah, and that would have to collapse. Uh, electives or, or the smallest because sections these teachers can it. only yeah. teach so many so sections well. under their current contract mm -hmm. and so they would have to teach more sections of the core courses and therefore eliminate the electives. 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 Yeah. How many sections are they teaching, yeah. so these teachers? Um, a full-time teacher uh, at the high school teaches five sections. So the but these two teachers are not. They're not full-time. So they're going to be that much closer to full time with these. You're getting one to full time and one to point nine, or what are you doing? One will go from point six to point eight. Mm -hmm. One will go from point six to point seven. Okay. And both of them can do that. So it's not a concern. Yes. Yeah. And you don't need point eight on the social studies. No. Why? Because econ. Yeah, I know. I didn't get your 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 scheduling math. Yeah, so don't even try. basically, <laughs> don't bother. you're not a high school principal. You're like, try. yeah, you're like, I don't even get it. Okay. Have you ever played Tetris? <laughs> okay. That's um, totally what it is. This, and yeah, the money comes from? What's that? The money for this comes from? Increasing enrollments. Mm -hmm. uh, I think 
there's a lot of different places that it could come from. It's, it's a very thing. small amount of money. Yeah. Um, so, do you, do you want to know the, uh, the, do you really want to know the econ? No, I think okay. Libby told me not to try. Okay. <laughs> She's smart. Just speaking from experience. She's like Steve. <laughs> and this is being paid for. Yeah, so, so if, so if, I, if I we, yeah, thank you. Yes, I, I move that we approve the request from the superintendent and the high school principal for these increased FTEs. For English and social studies. Do you have a second? Second. second. Where's the money come from? Increased the grant's answer, if he were here, would say the, the the percent increase is so small, and we all know grant. His favorite word is conservative. Um, that he pulls it from tuition dollars or money that he okay. has budgeted. He conservative budgets so much he's, that he's he can cover. He's going to say it. retirements. He's yeah. It's one. Yeah. Retirement. Saving, another savings place. from. from yeah. It's all. It's fine. I mean, Sorry. if we're getting more kids in, and we're yeah. there's always an efficiency of scale on that, so yeah. it works. And Mike, we didn't ask you to have this information in advance, but do you have a sense of this year's exchange? Situation? What's that? The exchange, exchange or tuition? Oh. Um, well, exchange is just with U32. It's not with the whole region. The lottery. Lottery. Valley yeah, Winooski Valley Lottery. Yeah, Winooski Valley Lottery. That's different. And this, this board uh, has moved from 10 to 8 students that are accepted. And there were 57 on our wait list. Yeah, Jeez, a lot of wait Which is a good thing. Um, it's, nice, it's nice to be. Wanted. Okay. So, um, so we're at max yeah, capacity. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, doors closed, yeah. ancillary paths no longer skip down. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> any further questions on this specific proposal as part of the discussion? Uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Great. Thank you, Mike. Thank yeah, you. Thanks, thanks. Mike. Thanks, Mike. Is this our biggest class? Uh, yeah. yes. For the high school, yeah. I don't know if it's overall. So I'm guessing it's the biggest class we've had in a long time in the high school. It's really a historic thing for our city that we should remember we're coming back up. Mm -hmm. Who knows how long it'll last, but we're there. We're gonna go back. Yeah, over 100 years. Well, well, it's unclear. Yeah, yeah, totally. They just haven't gotten to high school. Yeah. But you know, we're gonna end up with over 400 in the high school pretty soon. So before Matt brings a sleeping bag and. and uh, <laughs> That's fine. That's a very important conversation. Let's, uh, let's, let's turn to uh, enrichment and after school. I think we can probably give this as a combined. Yeah, go ahead. That would be great. As a combined update, I can start off on after school. Uh, we have four members of the committee here. Um, so uh, as, as folks probably know, we had this board set up a committee to work with Libby to uh, solicit requests for a proposal for uh, after school programming. Um, the committee consisted of Bridget, myself, Matt, uh, Principal Ryan Harity from UES, um, two community members, uh, Rebecca Copans and Christine Zaki. Um, one MSMS student, Sam Brondike, and then she was not an official member of the committee, but we had Cassie Wilner, who um, works with After School Vermont, uh, who sat in on first available meetings and, and played a consultant role. Uh, we got four requests for proposal, um, one from the YMCA, which runs, uh, which is a nonprofit that runs several programs throughout the state. Uh, we got one from something doing business as part two. After school collaborative. After school collaborative, thank you. Doing business as part two, they became part two, and that's what's in my mind, uh, which is a for profit entity that was formed by uh, two educators in Chittenden County uh, a few years ago and now provides after school services, uh, licensed after school services at several schools, uh, I think exclusively in Chittenden County now, although they are interested in expanding. Uh, beyond Chittenden County. Um, one from the rec department, uh, which runs certain youth programs and senior programs for the city, uh, and then one from Community Connections, which is the current provider of both after school license programs and enrichment programs. Uh, the committee asked went through all the proposals, uh, we scored them, we asked repeated questions 
of all the providers to get clarity on affordability, capacity, quality of programming, uh, willingness to work with the district um, to meet needs, uh, the, the wages and pay scales for their employees. Um, we conducted site visits to um, all four of the providers. The rec department did not have a formal program you could go to. Uh, Libby is actually the only person who went on that site visit, but on all the other site visits, um, not all the committee members went, but most of them did. Uh, we had extensive discussions about what we saw on those site visits. Uh, with the exception of one provider, those site visits entail substantial meetings, sit-down meetings with, uh, with people who ran the programs where they were able to answer further questions. Um, it was a long and hard process. There was a lot of quality work. I think a lot of thoughtfulness given to it, an incredible amount of thoroughness. Um, at the end, and this was seems like a long, long time ago, but I think it was less than a week ago. Uh, <laughs> last, last Thursday, uh, the committee had a long meeting where we went through all the information for the final count and, and came to a vote. Uh, the recommendation of the committee, uh, which was unanimous, um, and again, I think a very difficult decision, uh, was that uh, we recommended that Libby begin negotiations on a contract with, with um, After School Collaborative doing businesses part two. Uh, the, the main factors going into that decision, uh, they met the capacity needs, which has been an issue in this district. They were able to uh, significantly expand capacity from where we are now. Um, the people who went on the site visit were very impressed by the quality of the programming. Uh, when we looked at uh, the complete structure for affordability, uh, including scholarships and subsidies offered to families, uh, it was the most affordable for virtually all income brackets um, and significantly more affordable for lower income brackets. Uh, People making seventy to a hundred thousand uh, would experience a small increase, but all the brackets would would realize savings. Uh, they also had other perks that were not offered. For instance, on uh, in-service days and late start days, uh, enrolled students got covered for free. There was automatic coverage and no extra charge. Um, they have quality summer camps, including summer camps at times of the year when other people do not have summer camps, like the last two weeks of August when, um, when most summer camps close, that kind of gap between uh, school year and the beginning of the school year. Uh, their wages were competitive and on par with our current provider uh, and with the other um, providers uh, and the, the recommendations around them were all excellent. Uh, the principals that have worked with them that we talked to uh, had all had very positive experiences about them being accommodating, uh, taking students veneer, et cetera. Um, so it was, it was a tough decision. The decision came with a couple further recommendations, uh, the first of which is that the, the cost structure, uh, which is not as easily, it's not as easily understandable as a sliding scale, which is what a current provider has, even though its affordability at the end of the day is, is more affordable, that they work with the district to make sure that the, the cost structure is accessible and understandable to families, so families are able to easily access it and, are, and understand it at the onset that there's not an impression that there's a cost there that's not there. Uh, and the second is that there was a huge recognition that um, the current providers, the people providing daily care to our students um, are doing an excellent job. And uh, we would like the new provider uh, to make sure that um, there's opportunities for our current providers to, to be employed with them if that's what the, the caregivers so choose. Um, so that recommendation was made. Again, it was a very tough decision. Uh, it was unanimous, um, which I think speaks to 
both the thoroughness of the work, um, but I also think it speaks to, uh, you know, the, the decision. It was, it was people came in with very diverse views and came out with, with one view. So um, I don't know if, if uh, you want to add anything to it. I would add that uh, we had just two really um, exceptionally committed parent members, community yes. members, were always really just lucky in this town that um, the, the, the way the community can step up, and that was that added an enormous amount of value. Um, and I also want to thank Matt Roy and um, Brian Herity, who were also on the committee, um, and really were some steady guiding hands toward keeping us focused on the needs of the kids, um, keeping them front and center. Okay. Yeah, I concur with all that. It was excellent, and people went above and beyond. Matt? You summarized it pretty well. I think, you know, the, I think there were some people that were really swayed by the site visits. Um, I think that played a large role in, um, in the decision. I think that the, the, the visit to, to part two, um, I, you know, full disclosure, I was not on that visit. Um, I'm somewhat familiar with part two's work, you know, just from, from, from colleagues in, in Chittenden County, but the, the part two visit was exceptional by all accounts and uh, really really separated them, I think, from the pack and uh, just all the other things they talked about. One thing that I would mention that, that, that I think factored into the decision for me a little bit, or just, just a, a, a somewhat of a small thing, but going so far as to talk about sending, if wanted, sending representatives um, that work with the students to 504 meetings, to IP meetings, um, to CSPs, um, and just the awareness and that, that ability um, to, to work with the school, connect with the school. Um, and I think a, a big one, especially with the middle school, one of my big things going in was capacity, wanting to, to increase the number of students that can access. And I think hearing the answer when, when specifically asked about what if a kid moves into the district and programs have already started, and the answer was we, we will, like basically we'll never, we're never gonna turn that kid down. Um, and so I think that that's a big, a big piece too, but it was, it was impressive. I think the, the process really speaks to, to and the, the unanimous decision to go with part two is really a, a testament to the process and also the, the I think that we discovered the best provider. Is there a question about the process or do you want to introduce the enrichment position and then just take questions about that? Totally. Yeah. Um, why don't you talk about the enrichment because they're Kind of related, it might answer some questions people have because the emergency piece is definitely connected. Okay, so one of the themes that came out of this process, one of the overwhelming themes that came out of this process, um, was the uh, desire to keep what I, what I refer to as enrichment programming and after school enrichment programming at Main Street Middle School in particular, with a slight connection to the high school as well. Um, that is very important to our community. It's very important to me. Um, it's very important to our, our middle school staff, recognizing that those kind of opportunities are what adolescents need um, for multiple reasons in terms of mentorship, in terms of finding a love and a hobby. And a, we've talked about all of those things before, and I think we talked about them in the last board meeting, so I'm not going to repeat that. But I just want to say that's an overwhelming need and desire. At the last board meeting, um, I presented to you the possibility of a .5 position to keep that piece going, um, and you offered up, like, where's the money, what's it look like, that kind of thing. Went back and I talked to a few people, um, and many people said, what if it were a 1.0? And we talked about that a bit last time as well, I believe. Um, so taking that, I, um, through the coordination with, quite honestly, Drew at the middle school, um, who helped write this job description um, with me, um, came up with the job description and, and what if it were, kind of a what if it were. Um, and he, he had a, many more, I kind of condensed it in here so we could see it on the page. Um, and then uh, what would the contract look like and what would the potential monetary streams look like. Um, so this is using that, if you flip over this, this paper to the chart on the back, and yes, I can talk to Grant about this <laughs> just before anybody asks. Um, the district contribution already, we budgeted just over $37,000. I just rounded it down to 37. I think it's 37,285 or something like that if you really go into the exact numbers. 
um, that district contribution could pay this position salary as it's currently being paid now. So it wouldn't, so the position that is provided to us by Community Connections is paid this salary. Um, and that inclu is inclusive of FICO and benefits and that kind of thing. Um, that wouldn't be a pay cut, wouldn't be a pay increase, it'd be an even steal. And we already have that money budgeted. Um, that's already there. If we were to look at, um, this does not have a sliding scale. What I did was I took what's currently there and the $50 is the middle ground. Um, that's not to say it couldn't be a sliding scale. It could very well be, but for ease, in this situation of just getting monetary, monetary ideas, I just left the 50 um, in there, just as the middle number. If we were to run um, a certain number of 10 clubs in a seven week cycle throughout the year, and that's inclusive of the high school as well, um, which is a lot of clubs, uh, and I think it's more than what we currently offer. It's about what we currently offer. Um, parent contribution at $50 a club would be about $37,500. That money could be, um, would be used to pay, oh, I'm sorry, the, the enrichment corner is 53, or 43. So you, you take some of that money to add on to the 37 to do the salary. Um, stipends and club advisors, if you will, the people that we would need to hire to, to teach these clubs, um, would be about $280 a club since it's a seven week, about an hour and a half after school. Um, that works out at $25 an hour. Um, so that's what the cost of running that amount of clubs would be. We'd still have money left over for $6,000 of scholarship money um, and, and about $6,000 of supply money to, to revamp when we need it. Canoes, kayaks, uh, Dave, Dave was talking, Dave at the high school here was talking about getting mountain bikes that fit high school bodies. Because we only have high school, we only have mountain bikes that fit middle school bodies. <laughs> um, so like that kind of, that kind of purchasing that, that is in the plans. Um, we've talked a lot, we talked at the, at the after school advisory committee actually about, Bridget brought up some good points of why make, why make people pay, um, why have that. We we've went back and forth on that um, a bit and I think that's still an open question. Jim made a good point of let's keep what we have going now going and the way it's going um, for a year so we have some time to really think how we want to do that. I still have the question, the question hasn't been answered for me. My dream is to grow this, is to grow it between the middle school and the high school. Um, and, and if we don't ask people to pay, then that will continue to be a local budget expense. We can't grow it as well, or as easily. We'd have to find out more creative ways to fund it. <laughs> um, so so that, that would be a barrier to growth, but I don't think it's a barrier we can't overcome. I'm just saying it'd be a lot harder to grow. Um, so that's this piece. Again, I'll reiterate, this is incredibly important to our parent community <laughs> and, our, and our community um, after this experience with after school care. The piece between licensed care, that is a big need, K through six, I would argue, and, um, and unlicensed, this is unlicensed care. Matt, would you add anything to the enrichment? I would add that it's, it's important to, it's not just the parent community, it's really important for the kids. These are, these are opportunities yes. that they, they talk about at school. These are opportunities they look forward to all day. These, are, these Sometimes these are the things that kind of like get them through the day. Yes. Um, but it's the kayaking, the mountain biking, the trips to Bolton, um, the, the sledding, you know, in, in uh, yeah. Iowa Park. It's, these are opportunities that the, you know, the, the, oh, and some kids, they, they otherwise don't, they, they wouldn't have to, they wouldn't get those opportunities. So, Oh, just that. Yep, absolutely. So this position, as it's framed here, is cost neutral to our budget. It's not an addition to our budget. It's money already budgeted, just used in a different way. So, um, in the memo, it talked about a fifty-dollar fee per club. Mm -hmm. um, is that only for after-school clubs, or is that all? Clubs? That's for, that's for, that, that's the club that is like what we have now. Um, so when you say all clubs, are you going to like soccer and basketball? Because no, that's what I'm we talked like about. going like RGA, the, the conversation. Oh, no, 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 the, action, no, the, those, no. Kind of those things happen mostly, they, there's some after during school. Day, yeah, but yeah. it's during contracted hours right. that those happen. Well, the club action is after school, I think. Is it? They have, those go, those fall under that stipend that we talked so much about last time, the okay. co-curricular stipend. 
this is all this question that I yeah we have yeah. and I really think part of what we have to do next year is really think about these fees are non-academic activities yeah how we charge yeah. for them data I mean I think data is really important I think thinking about access is really important um, but if we are trying to make sure that we roll something out and, yes. and so this is kind of a status quo rollout with the kinds of things that are currently being paid for on the sliding scale <laughs> But yes. it proposes basically a status quo. Yes. Um, yeah, it kind of takes that piece and moves it in house. I think it's the ability right. next year to talk about well, do we want to continue these services or maybe structure them differently? And have the people in our employ yes. who we can have the conversation with. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's a really tough question. Right? Yeah. Right. And what the difference is between these enrichment activities and sports. Yeah. Co curricular. And, yep. yeah. Um, yeah. Private enrichment activities and yep. <laughs> other clubs. We have a lot of questions to unravel. <laughs> so I understand, I think, that this is a, a money neutral issue compared to what we talked about. But you said you brought it back and they said, why not um, full time? So I'm asking, why? Mm -hmm. In other words, you came saying not quite full time. Yep. This is what the person will do. What was added? Yep. That you Good think. question. When I what I came to you last time with is a logistical coordinator. So I came with like my idea last time with the point five was collect the money, put out the registrations, make sure people get paid. You know, Find the people. Right. Because I didn't want to put that out in my already overstressed and overburdened business office. Right. Yeah. That was what I came to you last time. Um, what what others made me think about was there's a lot of holes here that I know the community has brought up and the board has brought up as well in terms of all the things that we offer or don't offer um, and a liaison between pieces. So a liaison between Matt McLean here at the high school and Flexible Pathways and other things that the high school is offering as well as with Matt Link in terms of athletics and, and a liaison there. Somebody who can actively pursue grants um, and has the time and capacity to actively pursue grants to fund to find another funding system. Somebody who can actively and willingly um, collect the data we need around who are we serving, when are we serving them, what's what's really tar what's getting a targeted population, what's really increasing their their participation in this piece. Um, so those are some of the things that you see here that like the logistics coordinator that I, that I suggested before wouldn't necessarily do um, because they wouldn't be paid to do that, right? So this position would offer up more of that piece. The connection of personalized learning plans. How can we connect it particularly at the middle school level to raise the level of those through enrichment and developing um, interests at the, at the middle school level? Like that's a, that would be a completely nuanced piece that we probably, not many people have that piece, <laughs> you know? Um, so this would require a different skill set. Thanks. Steve? So I want to shift gears to the other one, uh, to the other piece of this, which is the, the um, whatever it's called. The, the, yeah, the, the, the license. license. That's what the we're called. Um, so I think that I'm seeing these two components kind of moving in opposite directions a little bit, and I and I want to kind of just kind of differentiate them a little bit. I think that the part we were just talking about with the middle school, I think, is a really amazing thing, and it, I think from a public education philosophical perspective, I think it's a very positive move, move because what it's doing is it's um, in, in a very small way it's um, expanding public education in America, right? It's actually um, it's actually ta it's having the school take a little bit more responsibility for that whole child, including the time they're outside of school, because that time matters so much to the time they're in school. And so I, I can't thank you all enough for moving in that direction. The, the license piece I have some reservations about, and I want to be very clear about my reservations, because I think the, the committee probably did, you know, without kind of, I was at arm's length, but it seems to have done an amazingly thorough job. But I think from a philosophical perspective, I have some problems with it, and I think that the biggest nut of that is that we're taking a function that has been, in our area, has been a public function, has been provided by a school, education, and we're privatizing it. And I think that that is, we're now sending it off not just to a for-profit, not just to a business, but to a for-profit business. 
and as maybe the only person, or maybe there's one or two other people on here who works for a purely for-profit business, and I, you know, I own it, and I, I, I can speak from some authority here when I say that that's a very different animal. And it is, it had, it finds, it is very, it can be very, very professional and make excellent presentations and, and administer programs extremely well. And it finds efficiencies. And I want to be very careful if this district leaves a legacy of privatizing a public function, that that new entity that we contract out to, to do what has been a public function, does not find those efficiencies by either paying employees less or charging parents more. And those two places are where the revenue can come from most easily. And the history of private businesses is that they tend to pay employees as little as they can get away with. And I just want to be very careful about that. One of the things that I mentioned during our public hearing at the beginning of this process, and our superintendent agreed to it or nodded her head, was that livable wages would be one of the, the community values that we would insist happens during this process. And I want to make sure that in the contract that we have livable wages so that we do not, because right now, our, the current provider, the public entity, is providing livable wages. And if we don't insist on that going forward in the new contract, then what we're doing is we're saying it's not a fundamental piece here. We're willing to allow the new entity to subsidize um, this program or find efficiencies in the program with wages. I just want to be very careful is all I'm saying. I think we can do it, but I think it needs to be at a contractual level that the pay scale be in the contract and that it be very clear about that. Um, otherwise, I think we, we cannot stand our, keep our heads up and say that, yeah, we privatized, but we're not sure if it's going to be a livable wage. They gave us assurances, but that isn't the same thing as a contract. So I want to be very careful about that. Um, and then the other piece is the, is the, the, provi or the, um, the, the family contributions, which I saw the thing. It was very hard for me to, die, to kind of tear it apart because I, it felt like um, we had some of the cells in the boxes weren't quite lined up because they didn't really equate across exactly, and I didn't know enough to really ask the right questions about it, but it was complicated to me. I know that, I think that I, I understand in the, in the um, subsidy picture, the way that uh, Community Connections has done it is that there are a few families on subsidy, but mostly they just kind of internally subsidize, is my understanding, or at least they combine the two sources of income. Um, the, the public subsidies are very small, usually like a few dollars, um, but uh, there has been some internal subsidizing too, from what I understand. Um, and I understand that the new model would rely on the state subsidies um, probably more, I'm not really sure. And if that's true, is there a bureaucratic piece to that that may actually leave some families behind, they may not actually pursue those subsidies? And is there, how bureaucratic is that? And if we're, if we're changing from what is really a very simple system right now about how you get subsidized, a sliding scale effectively, to something where families have to apply to the state for a subsidy, is there not just a, not just a, an information packet, but actually someone there to kind of be the facilitator to make sure that happens, so we don't lose people in that transition. So those are my concerns. I want to make sure it stay, it, it is equally affordable to families, and that we do not subsidize it with employees. And um, I'm hoping that the contract will include those two things. If it does not have some kind of provision for liberal wage. I'm really opposed to it. So I hope it's in there. Can I respond to some of that? Yeah. I just, I just want to say that we have a very serious, substantial, and prolonged committee process to vet these options, to consider all of these things, all of the issues that you discussed were the subject of these meetings, which being on that committee was open to any member of the school board, and those meetings were open to the public. And I just want to assure the public that this is not the first time that anyone has talked oh, about sure. those issues, okay? That was a focused, intense discussion on a committee that had to make very difficult choices. Great. And again, it was open to anyone on the board to be on that committee, and it was open to the public to come to the meetings. And, and that many of the committee discussions were really around how the contract should play out, focused on staffing, focused on wage issues, and focused on the issues of the fee system is for parents. So, I, I, you know, I just, that's been what the process has been about. Cool. Um, so what's the so, result? And the result is that the committee unanimously recommended that the superintendent negotiate with Part D out of the options that we had before us and provide something in the 
contract for government employees, and you know, I'm not sure that that contract is settled yet. But how about the wages? Will they be in the? Did you guys suggest that in the contract? Well, the wages were in the RFP, so. We so the, the, the wages are required under the RFP to be a yeah, specific the scale. The wages were in the response to the RFP, yeah. so we had reached the end of scale. Mm -hmm. And those are livable. Mm -hmm. They're they're on par with all the other providers. That's not that's low wage. Uh, child care providers are historically low wage. What I'm wondering is, are they are they livable, livable wages? They don't even have to be equal to whatever folks are getting paid now. I don't care. What I'm saying is, are they do they meet the standard of livable wages? By what? Yeah, by I, I the by the, the congressional or the uh, the legislative, uh, I think legislative fiscal office has done the study. I'm not they sure. do it. They do it on a biannual yeah. cycle with the joint they fiscal were, office. They establish a livable wage. It's a, there's objective standards in Vermont. Yeah. Um, Wait a minute. I want. I, I mean, this is an important point, Bridget. What I'm hearing you say is, "Hey, you missed your opportunity," and I don't no, agree. I'm, I'm saying, on the board. I'm saying. I'm not saying. Well, actually, the board isn't approving the contract. I'm saying that not, that's fine, that's and I'm saying issue, it doesn't I'm mean saying, I can't speak up as a board member. Yeah. You're welcome to speak so, up, but right. I, I think I didn't miss my opportunity. I think that the suggestion that I, I think that the way that it's been presented, I just wanted to clarify for the public and for everyone on the board to understand that these were the issues that the committee was looking. Right, and I want to make sure that they are now in the end result that they are going to be in the contract. That's all I'm asking. Are we going to have livable wages in the contract, and are we going to make sure that parents aren't subsidizing this because of the bureaucracy that's required? And I don't have any idea about the answer to either of those. So, so I'll, 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 I'll do we, I would love for us to look at a policy with regard to livable wage because this keeps coming up. Yeah. So um, it came up with regard to the cafeteria employees, the food service employees. And it came up again tonight with regard to the new middle school proposal. You know, I think we all keep saying $13 is not enough. Then we need to look, if, if we're serious about that, we need to talk about policy. Because I don't think that we can just dictate it randomly when it comes before us. So, so a few things on, on wages. The, uh, hard to compare to our current provider for the, there's two classes of, of the instructors. Um, part two, I'm gonna have it in front of you, part two paid, I think, 13 to 15 for the lower, counselors. for the counselor versus 13 to 16 for community connections, and then for the next level of classroom instructors, they were on par at 16 to 18 for both. Uh, CC did something which Part 2 did not do, which they employ for 11 to $12 an hour. Um, high school students and interns to provide care. CC does? CC does. <coughs> Part 2 does not, which means that CC is employing people at a lower wage to subsidize care at the expense of people at a higher wage. Um, so, on par. So, if, you yeah, know, whether you consider those liberal wages or not, the for-profit did not undercut the non-profit or Washington Post. So, are, are those two tiers some kind of like established tier kind of structures that you could go apples to apples on? It was difficult, yeah. right? Because they don't all staff in the same way yeah. or all people the same thing. And that's that's what I'm saying. This, is, this was the subject of a, of a lot of attention. Yeah. It's not an apples that you really have to sit down to try to figure yeah. out. What roles these people play? How many of them there are? And, and yeah. they're not exactly the same for each provider. Yeah. They have different models. For the, you know, roughly director type level, on an hourly wage, CC paid higher. I think twenty three or twenty six, um, and twenty four. Twenty uh, Part two paid lower, nineteen twenty one. But part two structured the job more as a full-time salaried position. So the, I think the, I think the people in those positions were actually making more per year than the people in CC. So it was higher, weight, higher per hour wage in CC, but it was more of a full-time job that came in kind of in the low 40s, which is roughly equivalent to kind of a starting teacher position. I think I'm mostly concerned about the, chi the direct childcare workers and how they are because they're going to be the lowest paid people in the organization, and we want to make sure, you know, absolutely. predominantly women. Yes, we want to make sure that this is treated with 
as a government entity, we need to make sure that we're not exploiting people. And that's I mean, absolutely. Content. And I think, and I think, you know, you know, clearly that was not the case. And I think if you're looking at these wages, if, if there's anything that stands out, it's the CC at the, you know, ten to eleven dollars an hour for, you know, high school care. It's like, how many people are they hiring at that level to provide care when they could be hiring? What is that? What, is that called high school care? What is that called? They call it high school intern. At least they didn't. Interns. Okay. Yeah. I didn't include it there. And what is the difference between the two tiers that two groups are using? I don't mean relative to each other, but I mean how are they stacking those tiers, or how are they? Is it like just a level one, level two kind of thing? They call them different things. One calls them an assistant teacher. Uh, one call, like you know, CC calls their kind of lower wage non high school intern an assistant teacher. Part two calls it a counselor. For the next up. Uh, These are the same. Yeah, uh, the they call them head teachers and teachers. Part two calls them a site director. Um, for what would be like a, a head teacher at no, an assistant director or an assistant. Uh, oh, assistant the director. Sorry. Assistant yeah, director. assistant director. Uh, and then there's the site director, which is the high. You know, for instance, you know, YMCA for a similar position. YMCA was a little lower actually, and they're a nonprofit. Um, program staff and then assistant site director. So the uh, short of it is they both start the bottom of their scales for their regular folks at 13. Yes. Mm -hmm. Those are all the same. Pretty much. Well, the Y was the, the lowest. Y the, lowest. The, y was the Y was the lowest. 12 point B. The nonprofit for the one. Yeah. The yeah. counselors at part two are 13 to 15 dollars an hour and uh, CC was 14 dollars an hour. Yeah. The one? CC was 14. No, no, the, the, what was it called? 13. The name of the position, counselor. The counselors in part two. Okay. The people who work directly with kids. Yeah, all three of them work directly with kids. Yeah. Um, so. So the is ones that who are the site director. Yeah. 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 So are wages in contract. the contract? Yeah. yeah. The contract has not been. I know, but would it be? Yet. Is it something we, you can put in there? Yes, I can put whatever okay. I want. Yeah. In the okay. And um, the. Uh, then for the, the subsidy piece, do I have that vague understanding correctly, correct that they're sort of using a pay scale, it's sort of an internally subsidized partially, and that um, under the new system, there'll be a more of a reliance on state subsidies, or is that just a butchering of the understanding? Uh, it really works? A, I would say it's a butchering. Um, part two has, for any family that qualifies for the subsidy, which is I, I anyone mean, under seven right now the way the state has it structured it's approximately anybody under seventy five thousand three hundred dollars receives a, at least a partial a ten percent that's the, that's the beginning so and that's from the state and yes. that's from the but state that's, that based on household size do you know yes yes it is, it is. Yeah. so it'll it's based vary on a house bit. yeah it's not an exact science okay. because it's it's okay. and so as, kind of as, as soon as the family qualifies for the subsidy, part two gives them a 50% scholarship automatically. So all families who fall, who fall under that $75,000 scale get that 50% subsidy. So, so they, half goes away. And then let me understand. So they, they, have to, they have to go demonstrate that, that they've got the state subsidy, is basically the concept? or Because the income verification is something probably the contractors don't want to be doing, but the state will certainly do it. Yeah. They help families work through the subsidy process. Right. Yes, they and we as the um, district can help with that too. Yep, and then the, the state would contact part two. So the money goes directly to them and then the bill gets changed. Yeah. Yes. So it's, it's the subsidy and then those families get a 50% scholarship. So as you go between the subsidy and the 50% scholarship, as you work you know, down lower into that subsidy, your subsidy increases okay. and that's where the that's where the cost comes. We did a cost comparison, it, especially for some of the lower income families. I don't have the, you might have the numbers right in front of you. It's, it's significantly right. lower. Do you, do you anticipate them. more families as a percentage will be on the state subsidies? I anticipate more families will apply for step subsidies. Yeah. Okay. Uh, one of my hunches, and I don't know if it's correct or not, it's a hunch, is that because of the sliding scale and because of a lack of advertisement about the subsidy, I, I think that people didn't. And there was. Right. And I think people yeah, confused, it was not transparent. Yeah, and I think people thought that the sliding scale was the subsidy. Right. Right. Yeah. 
nobody was informed about the other piece really unless right. they, it was one on one sometimes. Yeah. And and you know there was an acknowledgement that um, you know there will be a, a layer of more filling out and bureaucracy that you know that, that will be involved in accessing that money, which is why we have instructions that you know we both work on the contract and the rollout with part two that that be made very easy for families that we you know make sure they have the information and that for families that need assistance walking through that process they get that assistance so um, that's that's easy for them and it's not a barrier. Okay. I'm, I'm I think that's a really important part yeah. of the rollout. I mean, starting. I, I just don't want to underestimate that change. Color changes. Mm -hmm. change is challenges for everyone, and this this is a piece that's going to be starting May thirteenth. So you know, hot off the presses, there's. Jeff O'Hara, who's the guy who runs part two, will be at UES from six to seven. It hasn't gone out yet, because it's going out tomorrow. <laughs> um, flyers being made now, um, but there will be a parent info night where he's very well versed, because I had met with him today, about what, how he needs to really stress about his help and support and how we can collaborate in that. Yeah. And, and yeah, even though it is a for-profit, you know, the people leading it are, you know, are committed educators. And I, I think everyone, at least most people on the, on, on the committee, um, have a level of discomfort with a for-profit entity. Um, I, I think we share a concern, Steve, that uh, you know, privatizing elements of, of our, you know, what we kind of consider the public sphere of education um, I definitely have a level of discomfort around it. Um, you know, that said, there were you know there were some concerns with the the non the, the you know the the nonprofit groups. entities yeah. that that we had to choose from. Um, that on balance made the for profit entity favorable here, and you know I mean it's a for profit entity, but it's also you know, a small Vermont business that was is formed by educators who. I think are very committed to to education. I mean, their vehicle for doing it is is for profit. But um, you know, this is this is these are this is a, a homegrown homegrown business with uh, people who are very connected to the Vermont community, to the Vermont education world, um, and, and have a lot of depth and experience um, with, you know, kids. In, with with kids. I think I think too some of those concerns are, are also balanced. In Times in some cases in our discussions offset by the, the organizational structure, the organizational capacity, um, and, and sort of the ability to to take it and go um, and run a a you know a successful and a very you know um, positive after school program for, for students without 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 the district or you know employees or administrators or the board or whoever. Having to, to, to go in and fix or repair or oversee, um, you know, and, and provide support and organization. I think that, that part of that was, you know, the, the one thing that they're able to provide that it seemed like, you know, from my experience in our discussions that, that, a lot, that some of the others didn't was just a, a really solid organizational structure and professional development for employees and culture. Um, the culture of the employees and, and within the organization was something that really stood out to the people that visited part two as um, you know, just a, a tight knit group and um, you know, well trained and just it, it I think there's those elements that, that come along with it that 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 are some of the benefits there too that, that they're able to also in some ways do things that Well, hold on. You were totally happy until you said a public organization can't do that, and I disagree with that 100%. I think that that's a question of, of nurturing public entities rather than putting them in competition with private entities. However, I do hear that this is a major benefit of the, the predicament we're in right now is that we have one out of four who actually can pull this off quickly and professionally, and that we don't have the time or resources to build the public response to this. And so given that, you know, it's certainly, a, it's obviously a very compelling piece of it is the quality of the, of the, uh, of the part two. Yeah. Steve, I would agree, I would agree with that, yeah. that yeah. addition. I, I have a couple of questions. First of all, thank you, Bridget, Jim, 
Matt, everybody who was involved in this process. I know it was very time consuming, very energy intensive. Really appreciate your thought. Um, really important to the community. Um, and this, this position, um, I, I fully support this position and I really appreciate, um, I know I was frustrated a little bit ago and because I was hearing about needs but I felt like didn't, we didn't have enough information in the process. I really appreciated this process. I thought this was a great process, you guys. The past several weeks have been explaining how this would fit into a much bigger picture. We understand the needs. So I really appreciate this. I'm, I'm in full support of, of this position, without a doubt. Um, with regard to the subsidies, going along with um, Bridget's thought of, well, what if there wasn't a parent contribution or what, what else could we do? I do have a little bit of a concern because my understanding is previously this money was used in part to help subsidize uh, some lower, lower middle income students, and now um, this money is going to go fully to this enrichment. Yeah, is that not accurate? accurate. Yeah, we don't know exactly what this money went to. Okay. Quite it's honestly, we have, no, okay. we have no budget. A concern. Okay. You mean so. the revenues from the license program that you get revenue? No, no. $37. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought that, my understanding, and it was clearly a misunderstanding, was that some of that was used to. Um, that went into a pot at Washington Central Supervisor Union, and no one, including people at WCSU, could tell us where the money went. Okay, so I'll I'll just I know it's late. I want to cut cut to this really quickly. And Steve asked many questions. Well, you answered many concerns in answering his questions that I had. And thanks for your time yesterday too, Jim. Um, so how long is the contract likely for? Is this going to be an annual, biannual type thing? I'm just. They would run starting in the fall year-round programming. But right. would we enter into a contract with them for one year, see how it goes? Yeah. Okay. Bring them into in one-year contracts and make sure that we have pieces in there that they have, you know, accountability measures that have yeah. to be reached. Yeah. The which is not in our current contract right. in any way, shape, or form. Right. And that also ensures a certain level of accountability. Yes. Yeah. Um, in addition to those measures, just having it be yes. on an annual basis like that. Um, would the enrichment coordinator work at all with setting up part two? Would they work at all with they want to be working with them to set it up. Yeah. Um, they'd be collaborating with them, certainly. One of the questions still in this enrichment coordination is if it's 7, or seven 12 or, or 5 12. I actually talked with Jeff about that today. Um, just we, we opened up that opportunities or some of the opportunities to 5 6 um, as well. Um, and and Jeff, Jeff's like, we'll coordinate. We'll coordinate with that and we'll make sure kids can come in and out and kids can do what they need to do and, and sports teams and they're well versed in middle school needing that anyway because lots of kids are doing lots of things in middle school mm -hmm. um, so they talked about a camel's hump that kids go in and out and you know like they keep track of where they are and they make sure it's available and kids are safe and they're accounted for and all that kind of thing um, so yeah the, this position the enrichment coordination would certainly be working with the site director um, at the middle school in collaboration and making sure spaces and you know their their offerings because part two will be having those middle school kids out and about and doing things right. and using the facilities that we have at the middle school and so we want to make sure that that everybody has their space and that we work well together um, and that's one of the benefits of bringing this position into district we can do that we have control over it that way would you envision one of the concerns that I heard was um, from Steve and it sound, sounded like the committee had these concerns too, which was access to uh, these assistance programs. Do you think that this position at, would at all help facilitate, you know, getting folks access to the to this assistance, this public assistance at all? Or is that totally outside to, to the subsidy? Yeah, or this piece state, is, is this piece isn't connected in that way because yeah. the subsidy only applies to licensed programs, right. and this is an unlicensed program. So it, that position would not help. Uh, Okay. I mean, that program is internally subsidized effectively, right? Like right. with right. the revenues from the program right. would subsidize. Exactly. Right. Um, okay, last last thing, I realize it's very late. Um, if we identify along the way, and I hope we will be looking for these things, um, if we identify that there is an area of need, if there's like a benefit cliff, for example, near the edge of where the subsidies are, and we have some families that are like at 200, 250%, 300% of the federal poverty level, all of a sudden, uh, you know, paying hundreds or more. Part two will, will more, work with know. them. Okay. I was also thinking that might be an area where the board could step up and fund. We can make, we can make sure that okay. families have care. Okay. So we, we kind of need action. This part needs a motion. Yeah. Um, somebody want to make that motion? I move that we hire an original. Second. Any 
further discussion? Those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Next motion. Adjourn. 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 <laughs> second, second. Non-debatable. All those in favor? I don't know. I don't have an agenda. So.